Okay, I'm going to call so, the City of Sammamish City Council regular meeting for Tuesday, November 19th, 2019 to order. Madam City Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Christy Malchow. Present. Deputy Mayor Karen Moran. Here. Council Member Tom Hornish. Present. Council Member Jason Ritchie. Council Member Chris Ross. Present. Council Member Pamela Stewart. Here. Council Member Ramiro Valderrama. Okay, Madam City Clerk, we do have a quorum. Um, this evening, we have the Pledge of Allegiance is going to be done by Scout Troop 225. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much to Scout Troop 225 for performing our flag ceremony this evening. I would entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. <coughs> Second. Okay, it's been moved Second. and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, by a vote of three, five, six. <laughs> Six zero. We have approved the agenda. He's not on yet. Okay, our first order of business is an executive session. This is for pen potential land litigation pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101B and to review the performance of a public employee pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101G. We estimate this will be about 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, what? Deputy uh, first up, I want to make a motion. I want to make a motion that the city is to acquire parcel number 332506-9021 in the amount of 133200 And that is for a parcel located off of 4th Street, and it's for a right-of-way. And that will be the final parcel located to, to finish uh, the 4th Street project as far as the, is that the last? Yes. There we go. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, by vote of seven zero, the motion is passed. <laughs> we have another motion? I do. Uh, I move to authorize the mayor to enter into a separation agreement with Rick Rudimenkin that is attached as Exhibit A to this motion. The separation agreement provides for a separation date of today, uh, it's, what's today, November 19th, uh, nine months of severance pay <coughs> per the city's employment agreement with Rudimenkin and three months of additional severance in exchange for a release of all claims and assistance with a smooth transition. Need a second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those. Yes, I want it. Just, yep. Just hold it. Yep. I want it. Councilmember Valderrama. Yes, uh, I'm opposed to this motion. The, uh, you know, there's nothing against uh, Rick, but he has an agreement. I am not supportive of giving him more than the agreement. 
and giving him what in effect would be double the time off that he had it in the office to pay the service on the post for also a post because regardless of it didn't have performance goals given and so Ramirez, we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, so I will be opposing the motion. Okay. All right. I don't see any more lights. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. By a vote of six one, the motion passes. Another motion. Okay. Uh, while we work on finding a permanent city manager, I move to appoint Chip Quarter as acting city manager for the following consideration. Effective November 20, 2019. Actually, wouldn't it be effective now? Sure. Actually, it would be effective November 19, 2019. Chip will receive a permanent one-step pay increase in pay and additional 40 hours of bank vacation and 80 hours of bank sick leave. Second. second. Thank you. Second. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, by a vote of 7 0, uh, the motion passes. Chip, come on down. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Next, uh, we have public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to address the council. Three minute limit per person or five minutes if representing the official position of a recognized community organization. If you would like to show a video or PowerPoint, it must be submitted or emailed by 5 p.m. end of business day to the city clerk, Melanie Anderson at manderson at sammamish.us. Please be aware that council meetings are videotaped and available to the public. We have a sign up list. <coughs> So really quick before we start, we have several public hearings this, uh, this evening. So if you're making public comment relative to one of the hearings, it will not become part of the record if you make that comment here. So I just wanna make that clear. Um, first we have Deborah Minim, followed by Deb Sogi. Yes, and name and address for the record. And just make sure that microphone is on as well. There's a button down there at the bottom. Hello. There you go. Uh, how about that technology? My name is Deborah Minium. I live at 1109 206th Place Northeast in the Inglewood Platt. Inglewood Platt is one of the oldest um, subdivisions in in the area. Um, it's just uh, along East Lake Sam and up Inglewood Hill. So we are in a very delicate area. And I've lived there for 20 years. I've been through uh, when we were unincorporated King County up until when we became the great city of Sammamish. And uh, there is, three parcels that have never since the 70s when they were bought ever been developed. And my um, issue is that it has been turned over several times to various developers who have found it to be uh, uh, unbuildable. In fact, one of the parcels has been deemed unbuildable. Being in a critical hazards area, um, and as a profession, I am a geologist, uh, an instructor at Bellevue College. Um, the landslide issue, the, um, the earthquake hazards, and that is really important to me. And right now we have a developer who found it impossible to build and has sold the property to an individual who does not seem to want to follow the rules and regulations. I had contacted the permit office and I asked them uh, what I should do. They suggested that I contact the park and rec deputy uh, to ask for a land acquisition. 
from the city in order to maintain the, the um, slope, the storm water drainage, the water that it pr provides to the aquifer, the uh, wildlife, the tree canopy, and all of those critical issues that you address in the 2017 strategy that you have proposed for land acquisition. Um, I didn't realize that um, once we submitted it that um, it never had been reviewed or given to the city council for review for land acquisition, which I realize you had a, an executive meeting just prior to this in regard to that. I'm not sure how much money you do have, but I, I would really appreciate you looking into these parcels because the individual who now has it does not want to follow and um, is threatening to just one day um, to cut down the trees and, uh, and start grading without um, any permitting. And this is our concern as, a, as one of the members in the neighborhood. Um, there's also um, some other issues, one of which is it, whoops. Just wrap up really quick. Uh, it, it indicates that it's a uh, public land and it is a uh, roadway that the, the, these parcels abut. It's not. It's all private. It's all owned by the neighboring parcels. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, I have Deb Soge followed by Julie Kelly. Hi, my name is Deb Soge with the Sammamish Chamber of Commerce, and the address is 704, 228th Avenue Northeast, Sammamish. Um, it is about that time to shop again for the holidays, and I'm here to remind people. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the city, as I understand you're giving a proclamation tonight to uh, encourage people for Sammamish, or sorry, Small Business Sat Saturday coming up on the 30th November, right after Thanksgiving. But I would like to encourage everyone to try to shop when they can think of it in the city they live in, drop some dollars here, give back to your own city, and uh, I have some ideas for you. <clears throat> I want to remind you that there are still some restaurants and sandwich shops and certainly pizza places where you can get gift cards to give away. I know that's always great for teens. Um, the other thing is we have a gift store right here in Sammamish, uh, right after Carson, Carson Elementary on 244th, and it is a wonderful gift shop. They, it's accents, et cetera. You can buy online, but you can go there, and the retail shop is attached to the house right there on the property, and it's kind of fun to go there to shop in the trees. So not the store is not in the trees. You're not in the trees while you're standing in there. I can't talk right. But um, you can go in there and find all kinds of products from Sammamish, er, uh, Sammamish in Washington State. Everything was made local. You can have things wrapped. You can have them sent to and delivered. So there's something for every age group in there. And uh, she'll be open on Small Business Saturday and on Black Friday. She'll be open all day, both days. So you can just drop in. She'll be having samples of her food and snacks and all kinds of goodies. So I would recommend that you, if you haven't known about Accents, et cetera, you get to know her. Um, this is a shop that everybody loves because it represents what we all love, small business. And she's been there for a number of years and doing really well. So you'd be surprised what you'd find there. Um, the other thing is try to shop all season long, all the way through Christmas for your gifts. Be creative. Think of things you can get here. And uh, like I said, keep the money in Sammamish. Wouldn't that be great? After all, what are we, the highest median income now? So let's drop a little bit of that here. That's all I have to say. Thank you for the proclamation tonight. Thank you. Okay, I have Julie Kelly, followed by Paula, Paula Harper Christensen. Thank you, council and people. I, my name is Julie Kelly, 
and I live at 20620 Northeast 11th Street in Sammamish. I have lived in that home for over 40 years. I have seen people or developers come in, take the trees out, and then apply, say, oh, whoops, we don't want this to happen in those lot, plots, those lots, that one is right next to me, and it is a slide area. I don't understand why it's, somebody can come in. I mean, it will really s screw up the integrity of the slope. We have three lots that are still natural, still have animals. I've had a bobcat, raccoons. So it still can be a place for people to enjoy. I don't think taking all the trees and building a big house there will enlighten, the only person who will win would be Mr. Roy. But uh, it really is a critical area for, and we wanna, we wanna keep it. The trees are, are home to about the pileated woodpecker. There's woodpeckers, there's tons of squirrels and other, birds that build their nests there. And I feel that um, keeping it in its natural state is a benefit for all the neighbors on the Inglewood lot. That's all I have to say. I just wanted to put my input that uh, I did a lot of research on it and I talked about the critical areas and this, gen this particular lots have to have a lot of he has to have a civil engineer. He has to prove that it's safe. He has all these things, but I'm afraid he's the kind of guy that would take the trees down and then say, oops, because he's had tree people already looking at the lot and he hasn't permitted yet. Thank you. Thank you. Follow up. Good evening, my name is Paula Harper Christensen, 23416 Southeast 17th Place, Sammamish. I've uh, been in the same house for 33 years. As a longtime resident of Sammamish, as a child development specialist, lifelong advocate for children, I'm speaking tonight to sound an alarm, actually, uh, that our collective children they're not all okay. Every person in this room and every council member knows that our children need us to keep them safe. In Sammamish, we are known as the friendliest city, the richest city, the family-friendly city, and the best city. But we have a crisis right now, right here, in Sammamish, and our kids are not all doing well. With each anxiety attack, each bout of adolescent or childhood depression, each overdose, each school lockdown, each suicide attempt, we all reach the same conclusion. We have to solve mental health that we are in a mental health crisis. Yeah, we know that. We all know that. And right now we have an opportunity to take a giant step forward by offering broader services in our community, uh, by following the recommendation of Human Services Commission that they have recommended to add funding for two more trained counselors to work and to serve in cross path. This action is by no means a magic wand or a guarantee, but it is a step forward in serving the youth of our community. The Sammamish-based service called Cross Path 
is overflowing with the need for services. They cannot fulfill the many requests. The small request of $170,000 could be approved and services could be added in hopes of preventing the next tragedy. With so much talk about saving trees, saving deer, saving us from traffic congestion, I would hope that we would look towards saving our children first. We have a shortage of child therapists and psychologists. I'm almost done. Okay. Many of our youth have suffered what's called adversarial childhood experiences, which is called ACE and toxic childhood trauma. If we hope to have the mentally healthy youth population well, we must do better at providing services. Some of our, of our children are sick, some are dying right in plain view. A price tag of $170,000 is a cheap price to pay for mental health services. The responsibility is on us and the investment is gold in the bank. Thank you. Thank you. The next person, I apologize in advance. I'm hoping I don't um, butcher your name too badly. Um, Yundigur Dinga? Not even close enough. OK. Well, I knew I was going to butcher it, but I tried. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Good thing these no, meetings are recorded. It's pronounced Upinder Dinsa. OK. If you look at the spellings, there's nothing silent, nothing loud. OK. Uh, Upinder Dinsa, 215. East Lake Sammamish Parkway, Southeast. I'm a resident of this lovely city, as was mentioned by others. I'm also a builder. I'm also my son, my family, everybody lives here. The reason I'm here is very concerned today that, <clears throat> as you have seen, our attrition of staff is at the worst levels. I ran Raytheon's large division worldwide, and my attrition in the Department of Defense was less than 2%. My guess right now is that we are exceeding at least 25%. I have seen more planners, more inspectors, more directors go. In fact, I am here longer than most of your staff. A few of the people are still here, but one of the things that's not recognized as well, that Sammamish has some of the best staff. I have dealt with Bellevue, I have dealt with uh, Redmond, North Bend, all over, and the reason I started to invest more in our own city was for that reason. And I was the one who finished the uh, Big Rock Vista project. You know that, I was here for two years of hearings for that. The point is that we really need to do something because we are lo losing very good people. I have had some of the best ideas from Sammamish some staff. They are helpful, they are caring, and Either their salaries are not matching, I don't know what the reason is, or they are not happy in their jobs over here. Because I was here this morning, and I saw two new faces again this morning. And I come here pretty regularly. So my request is that even I think I'm welcome aboard, I'm seeing the third <laughs> city manager in my time, and I haven't been here that long. So there's obviously a systemic problem. I'm happy to help with whatever my experience is, worldwide, globally, with the Department of Defense, White House, you name it. I have worked with everybody. But I'm happy to help with any ideas you have, but we need to fix this problem fast, because otherwise more and more people will start going away to other cities. With that, I yield my rest of the time, so you can practice my name. Very good, thank you. Uh, next I have Jennifer Coombs, and anyone else that would like to address the council can kind of queue up along this wall here. I sent in my presentation at by five. I don't know if they got the pictures with it. That's okay. That's all right. Okay. So my name is Jennifer Coombs. My address is 22845 Southeast First Place, apartment 405, Sammamish 98074. And um, hello again. <laughs> I was here last week, and I did a presentation on um, the human services proposal in the biennial budget in the sense that they had already uh, put in the proposal to um, 
basically make some recommendations to the city council. And I did a proposal to say, yes, we need more human services people. Um, but I saw last week um, that that proposal was delayed and to wait for a meeting with the city council and the human services commission. And it was delayed until February 2020. And my request here is that that meeting happen earlier so that that budget can be approved. Um, so that's the take home here with that because I don't think we can wait until February 2020. As most of us know, we've been dealing with a lot of crises in the last couple years. And I would just, because we're working on the budget, there's things that have been approved. There's no reason why we need to wait until February 2020. And I'd love to see that meeting happen before the holidays so that um, that budget can be approved. And so basically what I would like to interject here and kind of piggyback on Paula is that we need to increase funding for human services positions. And I'd like for that to include not just counselors, but also nutritionists and people in um, public health um, education, mostly because there is a gap. And mental health counselors will cover part of that gap, um, but there's so, too many issues. There's too many problems, and the amount of time that somebody can spend with a doctor is about 15 to 20 minutes at a time, if that, maybe a little bit more, and they can spend more time with mental health counselors, but there is a gap in understanding of what these people need. And so what I did in the proposal tonight, and all of you would have received that. Um, I have no idea how much time I have left, but the biggest thing that these people are missing are there's nutritional needs and there's vitamin and mineral issues, there's macronutrient issues that people with addiction, depression, anxiety, PTSD, rape survivors, abuse survivors, many people are having many issues, not only due to the fact that they need support, but because they also need nutrition counseling. And to be able to deal with there's about four different axes in the body that deal with the brain, the gut, the thyroid. The, there's so many things that are going on that they're not getting the critical help that they need. So I do impress upon all of you that whenever you do meet, have a nutritionist come on board either for public health or whatever need that there is, have a nutritionist included in with the mental health counselor. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If you'd like to address the council, you'll need to line up here. Try to lean down. Good evening, everyone. My name's Stan Gano. I'm the vice chair of the Human Services Commission. Um, our chair is out of town today. It's his 60th birthday. <laughs> He's catching up with me. Um, what I'd like to speak to is originally the commission looked at where additional counselors would be needed. And initially we looked at $170,000 for 2,400 hours. Um, we kind of took a step back and said, instead of funding for the full year, we were looking at $75,000 for 1,200 service hours which will carry us through the school year. And that is what we were looking at possibly having considered. That will give us some measurables, that will give us a little, uh, a little more background and opportunity during that time period to eval evaluate additional areas like nutrition that just came up. Uh, we had not even thought of that. It had never came from any of the service providers who had presented to us throughout the year. Um, it's another area we need to look a little closer at. So our consideration was let's get some measurables. Let's see how many people are utilizing the programs. We know there's a demand. We know we've had two drug deaths. The counselors that we're looking at are actually trained in mental health as well as drug and alcohol abuse, which is essential. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, did you okay. Yeah. The deputy mayor has a question. Stan, hold on. Um, Mr. Gano, will you be... Stan, you're going to need to come back up to the mic, otherwise we won't be able to hear your response. I didn't know I was allowed to answer questions. <laughs> Typically not. Okay, yes, ma'am. Will you be staying here in case we get into a discussion on this later that we can... Yeah, I'll stay all night. 
Thank you. You guys buying that drinks could be late, after? You're, you're taking us out for drinks <laughs> after, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Is it? So is it Deborah? Yes. So unfortunately, because you've already spoken once, I cannot give you additional time to speak unless you want to speak during one of the public hearings. I I just. Is there any way to amend so that you know what parcel numbers because um, Yes, in the absolutely. If, in fact, if you want to give that information to our city clerk, she can add that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm not sure about the process. No, that's okay. Don't worry. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council this evening? Okay, seeing none, we will close public hearing. I would entertain a motion for a consent calendar. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Okay, by a vote of seven zero, the consent calendar has passed. Okay, our first order of business, we have a proclamation. This is for Small Business Saturday. Uh, Deputy Mayor is going to read that proclamation for us. And I am honored to read this. Small Business Saturday. Whereas the government of Sammamish, Washington celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community, according to the United States Small Business Administration, there are 30.7 million small businesses in the United States. They represent 99.7% of all firms with paid employees in the United States and are responsible for 64.9% of net new jobs created from 2000 to 2018. And whereas small businesses employ 47.3% of the employees in the private sector of the United States, and whereas 94% of the consumers in the United States value the contributions small businesses make in their community, and whereas 96% of consumers who plan to shop on Small Business Saturday said the the day inspires them to go small, independently owned retailers or restaurants that they have not been to before or would not have otherwise tried. And whereas 92% of companies planning, planning promotions on Small Business Saturday said the day helps them and their business stand out during the busy holiday season. Whereas 59% of small business owners said Small Business Saturday uh, contributes significantly to their holiday sales each year. And whereas Sammamish, Washington supports local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy, and preserve our communities. And whereas advocacy groups, as well as public and private organizations across the country, have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. Now, therefore, uh, now therefore, Mayor of Sammamish, Christy Melchow and the rest of the council, the city of Sammamish, therefore, um, we, do declare, we do proclaim November 30th, 2019, as Small Business Saturday. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Okay, our next order of business is our first public hearing. This is related to the setting the 2020 docket. Good evening, City Council. Tonight we are continuing the 2020 docketing process. After the joint meeting on October, Planning Commission held a public hearing and voted to recommend the docket request as presented by a staff. Tonight we are going to quickly review the docket request received before going over the staff recommendation. After this, you will have a public hearing and deliberate on the resolution to set the docket. The first docket request comes from the city and relates to the parcel that is currently home to Central Washington Uni University in Sammamish. The city proposes changing to the f future land use of the parcel from R1 to community business, CB. While this site-specific land use map amendment is not currently on our work plan, we do have a staff availability to take this proposal through legislative review in 2020. <laughs> However, additional budget will likely be needed to support some consulted time for this project. This project aligned with our comprehensive plan goal LU7, which talks about promoting community health and connectivity and active transportation routes. 
for these reasons, a staff are recommending this request to be docketed. The second docket request is uh, from two residents and proposes to amend Sammamish Municipal Code development regulations. You may remember that this request included many different text amendments, which we organized into uh, the overarching themes you see on the screen. Miriam will now go over the staff recommendation for this request. So both the expansion of TDR sending sites and modification of the TDR program align with the 2020 work plan. However, expansion of TDR sending sites would require additional budget and staffing. Modification of the TDR program could be done within the existing budget and with the current staffing. Both of these amendments align with comprehensive plan goal LU2 of preserving and enhancing natural features, quality, character, and function of the city's residential neighborhoods. Staff recommend that item 1A be docketed contingent on the docketing of item 1B, as well as docket request number three that deals with geologic hazard areas because they all relate to one another. The addition of minimum lot size, which was proposed through item 2A, was already discussed as part of the development regulation update that was done in 2019, and at that time it was decided that a similar outcome could be achieved by adjusting areas like setbacks. So for this reason, we're not recommending that item 2A be docketed. In regard to item 2B, the designation of unbuildable that's used by the assessor's office isn't intended to be used in this proposed way. Additionally, the city has a reliable way of identifying legal lot status and areas that are protected or restricted on a parcel. So staff are not recommending that item 2B be docketed. Some of the restrictions proposed in item 2C could conflict with the goals of the Growth Management Act. Additionally, the city's code and the enforcement of that code are already designed to minimize impacts of development on adjacent properties and address issues around tree retention and erosion in landslide areas. Finally, development issues that are related to septic tanks are enforced through rules and regulations of King County. So for these various reasons, staff are not recommending that item 2C be docketed. While item 2D is not currently on the work plan and is something that would require additional budget and staffing to do, it does relate closely to item 1A of this docket request, as well as docket request number three. It also aligns with policy EC 2.6, focused on avoiding potential impacts to life and property by limiting land disturbance and development in certain areas. So for this reason, staff are recommending that this item be docketed contingent on the docketing of the other two items. And finally, in regards to item 2E, staff are not recommending that this item be docketed because it's an administrative item, so it doesn't need to be docketed. Um, staff are recommending, however, that this item be considered as a work plan item. Items 3A and 3B align with our work plan through the development of the Urban Forest Management Plan, also known as the UFMP implementation strategies. However, there would be additional budget needed to hire consultants that have the expertise to guide these efforts. Staff recommend that items 3A and 3B be integrated into the UFMP implementation strategy development. And finally, staff are not recommending docketing item 3C because it's already covered through our existing code. Staff have concerns about how item 4A would be enforced, um, and the city also requires a notice on title for parcels that have critical areas. So for this reason, staff are not recommending that item 4A be docketed. Items 4B and 4C align with our work plan through the development of the UFMP implementation strategies. And while additional budget for consultant time as well as additional staffing would be needed to complete the work identified through 4C, staff are recommending that both 4B and 4C be integrated into the UFMP implementation strategies. So I know that was a lot of information. Yeah. Sure. Council Member Stewart. Uh, so you had, I think, three or four items that you um, recommended they be included as part of the um, uh, the forestry management plan. Mm -hmm. But you had a check mark there. So do they need to be docketed in order to be included in that? I'm about to get to that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> a great segue. Yes, indeed. <laughs> So on screen, you'll see items that I've pulled out from request number two that will be covered under the UFMP, so they don't need to be docketed. Um, I've already passed them along to Kelly, who's overseeing that project, so they'll be integrated as part of that project. 
Um, Sarah is going to be also providing a summary of all of the docket items that staff are recommending shortly. Um, are there any questions on item two or request number two before I hand things back to Sarah? Okay. Finally, the third docket request is another citizen request. This docket request aims to combine several different hazard areas into one geologic hazard area, and then review the development regulation to see if additional changes are needed. This docket request aligns with our work plan and creates consistently with the GMA. It also aligns with Comprehensive Plan Policy EC 2.5, which deals with the periodic assessment of regulation protecting erosion hazard areas and also policy EC 5.19, focus on additional protection and increase the stormwater controls for parcels in certain critical areas. This docket request would require additional budget to hire a consultant with technical expertise, as well as additional staff to support this project. Staff are recommending this docket request because it, the GMA includes the geologic hazard in their definition of critical areas. This will bring us into alignment as we start to prepare for the evaluation of the city's critical area rules and periodic update to the comprehensive plan. Here you see a summary of the docket request that a staff and planning commission are recommending to be docketed. This includes the site-specific land use map amendment of the Central Washington University in Sammamish, modification of the TDR program, and the work around geologic hazard areas allowing with related items of modification of the TDR sending sites and addressing vessel sloping areas with critical areas, which would need to be done after the docket request three has been uh, completed. Are there any questions before we move on? Okay. Before you open the public hearing, we wanted to do a quick recap of key dates related to this process. After the public hearing, you will deliberate on a resolution to set the docket. After this, any docketed items will be considered in 2020 during legislative review of individual requests. With that said, I will hand it over to our mayor to open the public hearing. Thank you. Is there a sign-up sheet over there? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, first, we have Mary Wichter, followed by James Eastman. Hello, my name is Mary Wichter. I live at 408 200 8th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish, Washington. And in full transparency, I am the applicant on document on docket three and also on docket two with Mary Johnson, who is not able to come tonight. Um, first of all, what I handed out is the Growth Management Act requires that you do geologic hazards, so pretty much it needs to get done um, for that one. And also, I wanted to let you know the Growth Management Hearings Board decisions view the GMA as effectively establishing two areas of critical areas, those whose functions and values are protected for beneficial services they provide, like wetlands, aquifer recharge, and probably streams, although it's not listed, and those areas for which protection is needed due to the threat that these areas pose to persons and property, which is life and, um, and uh, safety. So um, they're for geologically hazard areas, so I, I, I would like you to pass docket number three. It's also closely related to docket number two, and I wanted to show you a couple things um, for some of the topics. Um, so I want to thank staff for an excellent presentation, wrapping up a lot of things. The staff that I worked with is very fine, and I also want to thank Kelly Hildy, who's not here, because she actually pointed these maps out to me. These are from the town center, and they show where the sending sites inside the city are for transfer of development rights. On the right, you can see wetland areas can transfer in. 
in the center, you can see erosion hazards, Harriet, um, that can be transferred in. And I will say, Kelly pointed out, there's a discrepancy. This shows the erosion hazard near sensitive water bodies, and uh, the code actually uses erosion, but you should actually use all three, including the disturbance area, so that could be fixed. And then on the left, you'll see the Inglewood and Thompson subbasins. Those are teal and yellow, so I wanna zoom into that. The Inglewood subbasin is the teal one. It looks like an upside down lion. And the gap, if you go directly west from that, there's a gap, that's where Inglewood is, and it's not included. And then the yellow looks like a teapot, that's uh, for the Thompson Subbasin, where Ebright Creek is, and you'll see the gap between those two, that's where Tamarack is, and it's also not included, it's a landslide hazard area. So what we're trying to do is say, hey, you've kind of left these gap areas and you already heard two people speak at regular public comment. Inglewood needs some help. And by the way, the Inglewood plat is not in the Inglewood subbasin, just to clarify that. Also, Tamarack needs some help, as you know from the number of times I talked. And by the way, Mary Johnson lives in Inglewood and I live in Tamarack in full transparency. And there just are things needed and they've been skipped over. So for example, here's a skip in something. There's one of the things that staff doesn't wanna do because they say it's in the code. It's called sensitive area notice on title. And you will see down um, about midway page, it lists buffers and wetlands, streams and fish and wildlife, but it doesn't list erosion and it doesn't list landslide, except that it says you have to be one acre or more. That goes all the way back to 1998 stormwater code that we got rid of, but because this isn't in stormwater, it's environmentally critical areas, it hasn't been cleaned up. So these are the type of code things that have to be read through and looked, and if you start dismantling the things that we proposed, you're gonna miss those. So my request is, is go ahead and accept everything that you can accept, and then um, carry forward, and when it needs to get done, it can get done. If, it doesn't, if it's already done, then it can be done. So I don't have more time to talk, but um, I just wanted to thank everybody for the, all the work they did and tell you that the native growth protection easement one, you see how it has the word county there? This is from King County. It should also say city. So there's just tiny little changes sometimes that need to get made. So please consider moving everything forward that you can. And then when it get detailed, it can be done later. Thank you. Thank you. James Eastman. James Eastman, 196th Avenue Northeast. I've joked in the past about me and Mary getting up here and uh, taking up public comment time. I think the difference between Mary and Mary is I get up here and I just run my mouth. Mary, uh, <laughs> as you can see, she's incredibly thorough, detailed, and her input is really is uh, important and uh, as much appreciated. I want to just jump on this uh, mapping. Uh, this is a presentation I gave uh, a year ago, just showing uh, when they repealed the pilot, or three years ago when they repealed the pilot program, going over the NDA. Uh, next slide. What's that? You have the oh, controller. Awesome. <laughs> it's got it back. Maybe. Oh, shoot. All right. So the NDA is where basically you can't subdivide or do anything. Uh, Sammamish's mapping basically references the 1994 mapping done by King County, which was very general. Uh, so Black Sharpie marker, hey, we think this might be the no disturbance area. We'll check it out later after we pass the code. They never went back and checked it out. Uh, they said they're going to then question came up three years ago that, well, such so Sammamish have to go check this out. Well, no, we're not King County anymore, so we don't have that obligation. Okay, well, but if you go develop, then you can challenge it with a proposal. Um, and so you see on Sammamish's property tool, which I commend the city on, they uh, got that up and running. You see the erosion areas. I guess it's hard to see on here. Um, there's a green over that parcel there. And, but when you turn on the no disturbance area, it goes to red. And that basically is a contradiction saying, look, this is not even erosive, but yet it's so erosive, it can't even be disturbed. So there's clear contradictions on Sammamish's own property tool where the mapping's not, not even correct. Uh, also, the mapping of the uh, NDA from 1994 was never uh, addressed. It's supposed to be the first upslope break uh, coming up the hillside, never uh, addressed after they did the original mapping. 
and our city's own code, your legislative body, all that we do here, we could have lectures galore about the code gets, uh, ordinance is approved, it should be uh, implemented. The fact that we're saying, well, we might not have the money or the resources to go do this, this is in our code. I mean, as far as the NDA goes, it says the department shall maintain maps, supported by LIDAR, which we clearly know they're not because it's 1994, Datable or other suitable technology. I mean, we can clearly get on uh, these sites and see right off the bat where it's a slam dunk. Yeah, that's mismap, that's mismap. But we haven't done that. So should we be asking for money or time when our code already requires it? Do we get to pick and choose uh, what code we follow and what code we don't? Uh, TDRs, that's in there too. I mean, that's 1994, so let's open it up. Let's address the Inglewood lots, the, even in the erosion hazard, we can't transfer those out yet either. So uh, I support uh, many of these uh, proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Acting City Manager, I will say that I, I am, um, it might be worth taking a quick note about the code that we have. I think he put up there 21A.15417, um, and it does say shall, and says use LIDAR, and we don't. We, If there is a budget request for the biennial budget, we might want to look at adding that in for, this is next year, I'm not talking about mid-buy, um, because I as assume there is a cost associated with using LIDAR to map the city, but if our code says we're supposed to do it, then we should be doing it. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna close this public hearing. And I am going to turn it over to council. Um, quick question for staff, because there are several items here that we need to go through. Do you guys have a graphic that you can put up here to kind of help guide us through one, two, three, and because there's different iterations of numbers two and three and four, that might help us for flow purposes? So I think one and three fit nicely onto one screen. Two, because it's so large, mm -hmm. the easiest thing to do might be to look at the summary that's in your packet, um, which I don't have. I think it's exhibit two. It would be the docket summaries. Um, and I can pull them up on screen as well. Okay, that might be helpful. That way the audience can sure. follow along with us. So. Um, Docket request number one is the site-specific land use map amendments, um, and the applicant was the city, so I'm gonna open it up to council for questions, discussion. Uh, council Member Stewart. So <clears throat> one question I have is um, effectively, we're effectively upzoning that to a, a community business. My understanding is that there are some critical areas around there. What kind of impacts will we be having on those critical areas by upzoning this? I wanna be cautious to move forward on something like that. So can you address that? Yeah, I'm actually gonna have Doug McIntyre come up and talk more about the project. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor Mautau and members of the council. Doug McIntyre here, Transportation Planner, City of Sammamish. Um, so that's a great question. There are, uh, uh, George Davis Creek is in the back on the north side. There are wetlands, those are um, buffered and um, uh, delineated with a split rail fence currently and signage as well. That was installed when the property was originally um, developed. So uh, for the request in front of the council tonight, uh, it's more about uh, is there an interest in pursuing this uh, analysis further and the, at the point that there is any development considerations in the future, that would that would go through development review. Um, all environmentally critical areas would be, um, again, reviewed and uh, delineated and identified as part of a development proposal. But there's uh, no proposal for development in front of council tonight. But I guess I'd like to know more about why you're recommending that we would even open that door. Yeah, so um, a little background and context on this one is, um, so I'm uh, working currently with Sound Transit on the location of their North Sammamish Park and Ride project. And uh, back in uh, June, early June, council received a presentation uh, regarding uh, kind of a progress update, status update. And at that time, there were five potential sites um, being considered for the park and ride. And uh, that was during their phase two review. They've now progressed into their phase three, which is narrowing the list of sites. And using city council input, 
Um, they've narrowed it to the three remaining sites, which are um, the Central Washington site, uh, the site that is currently being discussed right now, um, the site just north of City Hall um, in Town Center, also known as the JCL property, and then um, a site in Town Center. And so uh, uh, during that conversation with council, council expressed that if, if Sound Transit does pick the Central Washington site as the preferred site for the park and ride, that um, the council really did not want to see a surface lot uh, be built in that um, prime location in the city. So uh, we discussed that internally. We um, uh, thought that one of the ways that the city could make that a site where something better than a surface lot gets built is to look at the zoning. And so that was where the genesis of the request came <coughs> from. Um, so in regard to any future development proposal that is at this point in time uh, unknown for in, in large part. Um, however, the city would um, in the case that Sound Transit does choose this site, um, it would be a greater potential for something like a mixed use development or something that would accommodate a structured parking and make it pencil. So when, at what point would the environmental impacts be assessed by attracting, car, I mean, if you're talking about making that the park and ride, we're talking about attracting cars there on purpose, right? Lots of them. So what, at what point would the environmental impact assessment be done for that? Um, because I, I worry that we put the cart before the horse here a little bit. Yeah, so that's a great question. There would actually be two times that we would do SEPA for this. So there would be a programmatic SEPA for the land use amendment, uh, land use map amendment. Um, and then at the point that there were, if, if there was a development proposal, there would be a project level SEPA at that point. And so at both of those points, there would be opportunity for a comment and um, disclosure of various uh, environmental impacts. So for that first one, that would be, if, if we move forward with this, you put it on the work plan, you would do that programmatic environmental study. And is that where you would look at the feasibility of this being any kind of mixed use at all? And you would come back with some sort of a, an, an analysis on that that says, yeah. you know, yeah, it would probably be okay, or oh gosh, no, it wouldn't be okay at all, or? Yeah, that's correct. So we would, at that point, we would know um, generally what, um, what something might look like in a conceptual sense. So we could look at traffic analysis and um, a variety of other um, impacts related to a future project. Um, however, at the project level, once there is a development proposal, there would be additional analysis. I have some questions too, so long as you're up there. So um, I understand the reason that we're trying to shift this to the community business as opposed to the R1 um, zoning that it currently is because we would not otherwise be able to allow a structured lot there. Otherwise, we could allow a surface level lot there, correct? Yeah, and there's a little bit of a nuance to that in the sense that um, uh, Sound Transit has a budget for this project. I, I believe it's around 20, $23 million. So um, their analysis, everything that they've been um, telling us during this process <coughs> is that they, they do want to build a surface lot. Uh, as it's zoned right now, a commuter parking lot is an allowed use, or sorry, is any, a conditionally allowed use. Um, so they'd have to go through a conditional use permit. There is um, a height limit uh, of 35 feet in this zone currently. So it would be potentially um, possible for them to do a parking structure. However, they would have to have they would have to go it alone, and they would have to fund the whole thing themselves. And they've made it clear that they do not want to do that, and that they don't think it's feasible with the budget that they've been given. So, with the community business zone, there is a greater range of uses allowed in that site. So, the idea there is that potentially um, there could be more partners involved so that Sound Transit could look at building something like a structure that could potentially have other types of uses incorporated into it to allow for it, the project to pencil effectively. So I do have some other questions though, because um, in the residential zone, we allow for schools and there's a higher height limit for schools, is there not? Yeah, I don't uh, know the exact answer to that off the top I of my head. I guess my question is, is there another way to do this without altering the underlying zoning? Because we're moving from R1 to what, R18? Is that correct? Yeah, so, uh, well, it would be a CB, which has a residential right, density allowed. Right, but there's a residential yeah, component to that, and I think that's my that's why my question is, is there a development regulation path to still accomplish this without changing the underlying zoning? Um, I So we don't think that's a very likely scenario. Um, I could do some analysis on that. I don't have, uh, off the top of my head, an answer for that. 
Um, but I do think that it would be um, very unlikely uh, if we were to leave it zoned that we would get a structured lot out of that. Okay. Does council have any other additional questions? I've, I've got a okay. question. Council Member Hornish. Um, Doug, thanks. The, uh, kind of along the same thought process I was having, I thought we could probably give a variance or whatever it's called to be able to do that if we wanted to put a structured lot there. Um, so, I mean, but the question tonight is whether or not to dock it. Maybe that would come up during the docketing process. What I'm more concerned about is we've got a tenant on there right now. If we change the zoning, they have an option to purchase this land. Doesn't that make it a lot more valuable and make it much more likely that they're going to do it? And if they exercise the option, we don't control it. We wouldn't be able to build it. They just get a windfall of increased value and sell it to, to somebody else. <clears throat> How would we try to preclude that scenario so that they can't just exercise the option, sell it, take the $10 million or whatever it's worth, and we're left holding the bag without a structured lot? Yeah, so that is that's a good question, and you're correct. There is a currently an existing uh, lease agreement with Central Washington University. Um, part of that agreement does allow for the university to have the option to purchase the the entire parcel. Um, so the my understanding is that so we have we have reached out to Central Washington. They are aware of this. Um, they uh, my understanding of the process, and I don't know it uh, very well, but. Um, for them to actually purchase, make a purchase on it, it would it would probably take a couple years for them to um, uh, initiate that process since they need to get funding through the state. So um, it wouldn't be something that would happen overnight. Um, but it, you're right that they do have do they do have that option in the contract. Um, I I I, um, I don't know if the other party would be interested in amending the contract. I, I just don't know that right now. Uh, but by the time that they would actually have any ability to purchase, we would probably have um, a lot of heads up on that. Um, but yeah, they, they couldn't exercise that option at any time. Well, and, and for the question tonight of whether or not to dock it, I guess that could probably go into the analysis during the, the uh, next year workflow. Um, and then council would have to say yay or nay, depending on how that's addressed. So uh, that, that whole issue could be dealt with, I guess, during the workflow, correct? Yeah, I think that that's a fair statement. All right, thanks. Yep. That's all I have. Deputy thanks. Mayor Moran. Well, my question kind of goes right with council member Hornish's, which was, um, given the fact that we have that scenario that could happen on that property and we have a lease scenario already taking place, didn't we have where um, uh, the university was trying to extend their lease versus purchasing? And they just extended it. Okay, so was it for one year? Or what was the time frame for that? The, I believe the extension is in um, uh, five year chunks. Mm -hmm. Um, oh. the, yeah, it is a five-year uh, extension, and they d you're correct. They did just exercise that um, option to extend. However, they can they can exercise the option to purchase at any time. And so, I mean, is that at the end of the year that that is done, or have I mean, have we already closed that out that that agreement? Because otherwise, I was going to say during that agreement negotiation would have been perfect for that. It's already done. We yeah. already. The, the lease term, I believe, starts in uh, March, but they needed to provide a certain amount of notice. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Stewart. Um, yeah, you also say that uh, this work is not covered in the budget, so is there a budget request that would go along with docketing this? Yeah, so one of the things that we're doing new this year um, with the passing of Title 24A is we'll add an interim step, so things that get docketed and go to legislative review, We'll do some research, anything that's going to have a budgetary ask associated with it, like reaching out to consultants, all of that, an estimate on the amount of time it would take to move things forward and actually complete the project. Um, we'll be bringing that to you all in, I believe, the second quarter of 2020 um, and asking for some guidance as to whether you want us to proceed or not at that point um, with those additional pieces of information. But the idea is if this is docketed that the work would be completed next year, correct? 
That's correct, yeah. And yeah. so you would need the money next year, but if we don't add that in our mid-buy, that's gonna make it more challenging to potentially raise said money, correct? If we don't have an idea of like order magnitude. That's correct. Um, I think our residents were pretty clear on that side. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I'm just curious, like, if if it's a large sum of money, we, I mean, kind of today's, tonight's kind of the time to talk about anything that's a large chunk of money. So I don't know if we have any idea what the order of magnitude is we'd be considering. So our intent with this was really based on the site-specific land use map amendment that we've just completed. <laughs> um, and so there is some element, at least for that one, of having a consultant come in and doing that external review. Um, and I believe we spent about I'm looking at David, but I want to say $10,000 or so on that. Okay, I don't see any more questions unless anybody up in the sky has any. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to say? I've got a couple of questions. Oh, go ahead, Romero. Good. So I don't have the maps in front of me, but the first question I have to see is this affect the boys and girls school? No. No, this does not. And then the second thing, how does this affect that we had talked about Central Washington University now, but one of the discussions of Central Washington is to help keep uh, students here, and as they've been growing, one of the things that they've looked at and we had wanted them to expand. They wanted to expand, and I mean, there would be another permitting mechanism to build another building to keep more students here on the oh, How would that be impacted by this move? So if I, if I heard you correctly, there's a, a question about um, impact to students using that for a running start. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the, in our discussions with... Hey, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? So if they, let's say they doubled because they have regular classes and wanted to build another building in the expansion and double the number of kids that stay on the plateau, what would this action uh, uh, impact? If, if they increase the footprint of the building. Yeah, they want to build another building. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that is a question that we would definitely need to, to talk to Central Washington about. We don't know what their needs are currently. In our discussions with Central, they are actually excited about having more parking at their facility, the, or the potential to have more parking. They, they feel like um, their nighttime parking is actually pretty constrained, and that would actually fit well with the park and ride, being that it would be um, full during the day, open during the evenings, um, generally speaking. Um, and so uh, they, they are, um, I guess, supportive of more parking. Um, as far as uh, whatever gets built at that site, if that site is chosen by Sound Transit, um, yeah, it would, it would probably limit what they can do to expand it if they were to ever buy the site and want to have their own expansion of that site. Um, but those are questions that we would definitely need to answer at a later time when we know what the need and the proposals are. So just as a reminder to council. Yeah, oh. Go ahead, Romero. So the last question is, by expanding down and doing this commercial expansion to Central Washington University, are we back to expanding the town center footprint? This would not be part of town center. This site is actually just outside of the town center boundaries, and it would remain outside the town center boundaries. No, but we had just talked about multi-use and other activities there, so that's why I'm wondering would it in effect expand it? Oh, so the uh, the central, or sorry, the um, community business zone, CB zone, does allow for a range of uses. That's that's what I meant there, that uh, it would allow for something like a mixed-use um, product, but it would not be a town center product. It would be um, uh, under different regulations than any town center projects. Thank you. 
Quick, quick question. When is Sound Transit due to make their decision on location? Yeah, so um, they have been working on uh, the last round of review for the final three sites, the ones that I mentioned earlier, just north of us, uh, the Town Center site and then the Central Washington site. And they um, are actually gonna be coming to council on February 4th to provide uh, more direction on what their preferred um, site is based on all the criteria, all the input they've received, and they've received quite a bit. Um, we had a open house in uh, July where we had really good turnout from the Sammamish community. We had um, over 50 people uh, come out and express opinions on the site. So they've been gathering a lot of input. They've been working it internally as well through their um, uh, process and will come uh, in February. I believe it's the fourth. So safe to say if we dock at this and Sound Transit decides not to pick this site, it's something that council has control over when we actually pick this back up to say, no, we're not going to do that since Sound Transit's not looking at this site specifically anymore. Yeah, and that's, um, in my opinion, the beauty of the comp plan amendment process is that council has uh, broad authority to um, accept, deny, amend, defer proposals as they see fit. Very good. I don't have any more lights on. Do you want us to go through each request? I think that's probably the easiest thing in order to dock it then. Okay, thanks. Very so. good. All right, so I would entertain a motion on this one. All right, I'll move it. I'll make a motion. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Hornish. Second. Uh, I move that we add uh, item number one as proposed in our packet uh, to the 2020 docket. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Op opposed? Okay, by a vote of 6 1. Dang. Oh, six, 5 2. We will docket uh, request number one. Okay. Uh, who is the other one? Councilmember Stewart. Okay. We're on to 2020 docket request number two. This is development regulation text amendments. Mayor, if it's okay with you, I'd like to go through the different items. So showing slide like you see on screen. So we'll do the sure. you know, ones first and then two and so on. Sure. Council have questions? Anybody up in the cloud have questions? I've, I've got a question. Um, Go ahead. I, I need to better understand, because it's kind of item two and three that we're on to right now, I know. I just want to better understand how the current internal TDR system works. If you have an R4 on a critical area and it's half critical area and half developable, if that's a word, how many TDRs can actually be transferred um, internally into the town center? Two or, and it's an R4, is it two or four? We've got David Pyle coming up to the microphone to answer. Make sure it's on. Uh, good evening. Uh, David Pyle, Community Development. Um, so that question is not one that I can answer um, here right now. Um, it really depends on the criteria that are found in the TDR section. Uh, my understanding is that this docket item is more focused on um, first um, potentially modifying the interlocal agreement, potentially modifying, taking a look at how we uh, handle priority of use of um, TDRs from the King County interlocal agreement uh, first versus local TDRs internal to the city. Um, secondarily, there's a component to this related to expanding uh, the areas where that would be eligible as sending sites for TDRs to account for some other parcels and areas in the city where there are there is a high level of constraint um, and we are facing development pressures. Um, so I unfortunately can't answer the question that you asked at this moment in time. Our TDR expert is actually not able to make it tonight due to a family emergency. She had been scheduled to be here tonight, but she has a true crisis going on in her family and had to be home this evening. Okay, and just so we all are on the same page, it's um, the King County has priority on a five to one basis from the county coming into the t uh, town center right now. Others are on a one to one, but we don't know if an R4 with a half critical area can get two or four. Um, and you're looking to do more receiving sites. 
is the idea. Do you have an idea of, uh, and, and I think when we went through this, there was, I made a note, additional staff and budgeting, same question that Councilmember Stewart asked a second ago, do we have a, a scoping of how much extra time and effort and money it's gonna cost to do number two on the docket? So you're referring to number two, item 1A. Well, I don't know. I thought, well, we're going to take all of two together. Uh, so, to no, if you look at 1A and 1B together, that's the TDRs. So we're going to go kind of okay. issue by issue. Each, got it. All right. Um, well, I guess I'll ask the question then on 1A and 1B. Do you have any idea? Is that a big time suck, lots of money, or is that relatively small? So uh, item 1A is a larger um time cost for staff because we have to look at mapping these areas and look at amending the criteria. Item 1B uh, is not as great of a ask of staff resource because we're looking then at um, a simpler modification of code to allow for um, use of the local TDRs um, as opposed to deferring for first use to the King County and our local agreement TDRs. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart? Yeah, um, so this is limited to only modifying the TDR program in terms of uh, the interlocal agreement with King County. It's not looking at potentially reevaluating kind of the question that uh, Councilmember Hornish asked, which would be evaluating the um, appropriate ratio for the TDR program. Is that correct? You could do that as well. We could. Okay. Because I, I think that's probably worth looking at. I mean, the TDR program was created a while ago now, and it's probably worth uh, reevaluating that as well. Just as a follow up on uh, Council Member Hornish's um, ask regarding um, staff expense and resource, the broader the scope of this becomes, the right. more work it is. So there's more analysis that's done with regard to the appropriateness of the ratios of sending to receiving and that sort of thing. Yep. Deputy Mayor Moran. Could you look at not having the agreement anymore? Um, could you repeat the question? Could you look at not having the King County agreement anymore and mm -hmm. just looking at internal? We'd have to ask a legal about how we would deal with, um, I guess, disbanding the interlocal agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and then that would be paired with a, an amendment to the code that would just use local TDRs. Yep. David, quick question, but, and, and again, back to what Councilmember Hornish was asking on his example of one that is half in a critical area. Is there legislative um, ability to control what that looks like? I mean, it seems like, I, I think the crux of his question is, is it's not really fair to say if you have an R4 uh, one acre parcel and half of it is encumbered by a critical area that you would be able to send four units out if really only there's two buildable units there. Is there legislative control for us within the code and a TDR process? Yes, there, there is the okay. ability to manipulate that in terms of um, generating the sending units okay. um, with regard to c constraints. Um, so for example, in, in an R4 zone, say you had one acre of property, half of it was constrained, um, that would afford you two units of development on the site. Um, and that would then give you two additional units that then could be pushed into the TDR program and then either multiplied if you offered a multiplication of those units or you could uh, allow for a straight, tra a straight um, transfer. Tra transfer just at a one-to-one -one ratio. It really okay. depends on whether or not um, you want to prioritize and incentivize uh, the, the, the dedication of areas that are um, encumbered by critical areas um, into things like Mary Wichter's asking for, like uh, native growth easements and tracks for the purpose of perpetual preservation. Okay. I don't have any more lights on, so. Oh. Did you have, I was gonna make a motion. Go ahead. <clears throat> I, uh, I would like to move that we approve uh, 1A and 1B uh, for the Docketing process. Need a second. 
Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Um, I just want to throw out that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You can speak oh. to your motion. Go, go ahead. Um, you, you have. Hold up. Oh, um, so I, I like the idea of looking at this because I think that we do need to assess uh, the current ratios of that, um, and I think it is important to make sure that we capture all of these sending sites um, to prevent building on areas where we really don't want. Uh, sort of some of that happening. So I, I think this is a, a worthy program to assess and to look at. Uh, it's a great way, I think, for us to preserve areas um, and to make sure that uh, people have an option uh, of what they can do with their land other than just selling it to someone who wants to develop it. And I think, uh, I think that we've heard that from our community that we want to be able to do that, so. Okay, I'm not sure who on their phone is trying to talk, but again, you can text my city phone to get in the queue. So I'm not sure who that was that was trying to speak. Who was that? That was that was me, Chris. Okay, go ahead, Councilor um, Cornish. And I'll, I'll, I'll text you. Um, is there, I, I don't know, if I'll try to make an amendment, but I'm not sure I'll do it. I'd like to separate these two, because I'm for one, but not the other. And I don't know if that's a possibility um, to do one A separate from one B. Yes, staff is nodding their head. It is possible. Understood, but he's asking about making an amendment. Are you making an amendment? Um, I'm not sure how to make an amendment when they're combined. <laughs> My amendment would be to separate it. I, I would, I, if I were you, I would make an amendment to remove one or the other out of the motion, which would nullify. Okay, I would. Uh, I would uh, make an amendment to the motion to remove 1A and uh, uh, move to adopt 1B only. Second. Okay. The amendment has been moved and seconded. Discussion now is relative to the uh, amendment on the floor, which is to remove 1A and adopt 1B only. Yeah. And I'd like to speak to that. Go ahead. Um, the reason for that is we heard that there's a, hello, a hello. lot more work on 1A than for 1B. I think 1B is kind of the instrument that we have current under the, uh, the King County Town Center TDR plan, and that's all we have right now. I think that's kind of gating I did before we start doing even more outside of that. Um, so I'm just thinking to save some money, save some time and effort. Uh, 1B by itself would be a good thing and relatively minor for cost and effort versus 1A, which was much more significant and probably a second step anyhow. Okay, Councilmember Stewart. <clears throat> Do you have a, uh, some assessment of the order of magnitude on 1A so that we know are we saving pennies or are we, is this really material? I mean. The fact of the matter is, is this was brought forward because we have some big gaps in some critical areas where people will potentially still be allowed to build uh, and that could be very detrimental environmentally um, and for uh, a number of reasons, so. I would say that thinking about, it, it this also pairs up with mapping. Um, so this, you know, the, everything always goes back to mapping, it seems like, <laughs> but um, there, there would be um, some efficiency gained in doing this in conjunction with another one of the items that's on the, the, the docket uh, for your consideration. Um, if, if that other one doesn't pass, then this one itself, I would say we're probably in the $40,000 consultant contract range for this to help us. Um, use existing information, do some ground truthing, create some criteria, um, and take a look at where the development pressures we've been experiencing are. Um, one of the benefits of adding 1A to the work plan is that um, it, it helps us as we uh, continue to ratchet down on the implementation of our critical areas rules, and it helps us in preparation for updating our critical areas rules in 2023, because what it does is it affords what, what I call a relief valve to those properties that um, would be, we would be facing pressure for development, but there is an alternative to development wherein someone is able to um, create a sending site and then lock that site up into preservation in perpetuity. Very good. Okay, I don't have any more lights on. Although um, Councilmember Valderrama appears to have fallen off. So can I check, is Councilmember Ross still on? I am. Okay. He's gonna have to call. 
I, I don't know how to because I don't know that Councilmember Hornish can call him. Can no, because they only have one line. Actually, I'm still showing him as on. Okay. Next in four five one nine. Okay. So he said he's online, but he lost audio. It's being in another country. I think is probably oh, his. Online. Can you text? I I can't, I don't think he can text in a vote. So, I don't. I'm not sure what. Can he hear us? I don't know if he can hear us or not. Yeah. I'm sure he'll. If he can hear, he said he lost audio. I'm telling you what I'm reading his text. It says he has lost audio. He said he needs Tom to call him back, but Tom has him on the line. So, okay. So did I. Okay. So the amendment on the floor is to remove one A and adopt a one B only. He can't. If he hangs up, then he is he is going to. Everybody. This is going to take a really long time if he has to hang up and call back in, because then he's got to call Chris Ross as well. Okay. He's seen. He never fell off. It's the audio from another country. Okay. So we are removing the um, amendment on the floor is to remove one A and adopt one B only. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, opposed? Nay. Okay, Councilmember Valderrama, I have no idea how you voted. I now. Sorry, what? I. Okay, I so. Aye. So, did you I need hands, sorry. All those in favor, say aye. And raise your hand, please. Voting on the amendment to remove one end. This is the amendment, yes. And Mr. Valderrama is an aye. Okay. Okay. Tom is an aye. And Chris Ross. And Valderrama. Aye. Okay, so the ayes have it. Okay, so now we are basically voting on the main motion, which is now basically the amendment as well, because it the main motion so, was one A and one B, but we have now removed one A with the amendment. So, all those in favor. Um, of 1A and 1B with the removal of 1A as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Nay. Okay, by a vote of 6-1, um, the motion is adopted. Okay, we're moving on to development issues, which is 2A, 2B, C, D, and E. Mayor? Yep. May I ask that we vote on the other motion to separate, I mean, the, I think uh, not to put words in Councilman Hornish's mouth, but I think he was trying to, to separate out the two motions. And so, sorry, what are you asking? Are you asking that relative to the twos? Yes. Yeah, I think I think it would be easier if we went through them one by run as opposed to having a million different amendments to pull them out. No, the, the one. I'm sorry. So the two that we just voted on, we separated out. Correct. To, uh, sorry, let me make sure. I'm, we separated out. 1A and 1B. 1A and 1B. Mm -hmm. We voted on 1A, but not. we didn't have a separate vote on 1B. Is that accurate? No, we because one... the, uh, the main motion was 1A and 1B together. The amendment was to pull them apart and remove 1A. Right. It has been voted on. We removed 1A by the vote. But do we not get to vote on having, the other, having them separately, or does it, does it matter? I mean, I... His amendment took out 1A. From being from them being combined. Yes. Okay, that's what I'm. So he removed one A. Right. That's what we voted on. The amended motion of just one B. The amended the amend <laughs> the amendment to the motion basically completely altered the main motion. Right. So what we have to vote on a main motion as amended. Okay. The amendment of the motion was to remove one A. Which was okay. effectively voting on one B only. That's what I'm. Okay. Yes. So back to the development issues. Um, we may want to take them one by one or lump them together as you see fit. So, Councilmember Richie, did you still, or you just have your list? Okay. Does Council have any questions? I move that we add item 2D to the docket. Need a second. Okay, 
I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion? I have a question. Um, we're back to the same question on uh, budget allocation, staff availability. Um, what does this look like? So David Pyle, Community Development. Um, this yes. one is one that would require uh, a combined effort between okay. um, a GIS specialist, uh, a, um, a planner, um, a potentially a, um, someone with a ge geology or a slope stability background, um, and would require some mapping um, and some amendments to um, our rule sets. So my estimation is, this is a contract in the magnitude of anywhere from fifty to sixty thousand um, dollars in working with consultants to help us with this. Okay. And it's also contingent on one A, which we right. just pulled out. Councilmember Stewart. So, <clears throat> my understanding of doing this is that we don't have a really good mapping of what our critical areas are, and. Uh, by not having uh, accurate mapping and by continuing to um, not have alternatives to development in those areas that we have significant environmental impacts. And we've heard consistently from our community that the environment is really important. So I would like to support this and I don't know, can I amend my own motion? You can just withdraw your motion. All right. And make a new one. I would like to withdraw my motion and move that we uh, approve 2D1A and number three, since these are the ones that you said that there would be efficiencies gained if we do them all together. And that would address. Wait, sorry, say that again. 2D what? 2D1A and number three, correct? Because um, these are the ones that by doing them together, we have an efficiency gain in terms of the work we're doing, and we spend less money and we get more impact, correct? Yeah, I don't know that we can, you can add in 1A, however. Different, it's a completely different motion. It, yeah, I'm not sure you can add in 1A, though. It's a separate motion. Right? It's a new motion. Side of that motion. Kim. If we're going to redo what we just did, we're going to be here all night. Yep, hold on. Just from listening, I thought that Tom's amendment to that motion just took 1A out of that voting process, was not never, that it took yeah. it out of the docketing Correct. process. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll from, okay. But May, that's he what was, voted on. Okay, he, let, my, okay, Tom, do you want to clarify when you removed 1A, why you removed it? It doesn't matter. Oh, I'm trying I to understand. Did not want, I didn't want to have the two combined we didn't vote it down per se because it was never came up to a vote. Correct. But it's the same thing as we're doing for 2A, B, and C. If we're not going to vote on it, we're voting implicitly by saying we don't want to add it. Okay, so then I, I will let your your motion with 1A since it wasn't formally voted on Correct. go. Okay, so 2D, 1A, and 3. And 3, so we if we can flip to 3 so that we can look at that. Be so well, because what we heard from staff was that by doing these together, we have efficiencies in the work product that we do. So we're not repeating efforts. There's efforts that they're going to do that would affect all three. So instead of paying three separate times over the course of time, we can do work once and get three benefits, if I understand this correctly. Yes? That was my understanding. That's correct. So uh, our staff thought process was if we started with request number three, that will provide the foundation, we'll have the foundational maps, which could then carry into some of the work that has to be done with 1A. There will be additional mapping needed for 1A because right now we have static maps for all of the TDRs and we need to change those. Um, and then it would also feed into the work that would be done as part of 2D. Right, and all of this is to get more accurate mapping of our critical areas which have significant environmental impacts, correct? Yes. Okay. That's correct. So quick question, because three is three A, B, and C, is, are you lumping them together? He's talking about docket request number okay. three, which is three. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. <laughs> Hold on, sorry. Just... Okay. I think I'm in the queue there, Chris. Oh, sorry. 
Go ahead, Councilmember Hornish. Um, if you look closely, 1A is not covered in the mid by, doesn't have staff availability. 2D, not covered in the mid by, doesn't have staff availability. Number three, not covered in the mid by, doesn't have staff availability. I know we're at least up to $100,000 by just doing 1A and 2D, and I don't know what three is yet, but 100 is too much for me, um, so I will be voting against this. I, I don't know that, Council Member Stewart. Sorry, I don't know that it's 100. I think when we do it together, it's not completely additive, correct? It, it really, as we get into it, we start to discover things. I, I would say that for those two, excluding three, that you probably would be in the $80,000 range. Okay. So, because there is some efficiency that's gained by doing them together. So what's the process if we approve this for the docket before you could do that work, you would still have to come back to council and ask for budget to do that. So there's, again, there's another opportunity for council to assess that. This is just putting it out there so that we don't kill it before we have an opportunity to, to have that discussion, correct? correct? So you would not you would not proceed with this work until you came back with a budget ask next year? That's correct. Okay, so we're not approving the spending of any money at this point. We're just keeping it on the work plan so that you guys can come back when you're ready and you'll have potentially a better idea and you'll be able to ask for a budget at that time. We would reach out to consultants uh, and we would reach out to other partner agencies and we would scope this more thoroughly um, once we had a more refined um, scope of work and, and identify what the costs were and what the timelines were. Okay. So we are not approving the spending of any money at this time. We're just keeping it on the potential to-do list. Okay. I don't see any more lights on. Anyone else? Okay. Yes, Chris. Yep. Go ahead, Councilmember Valderrama. Yeah, no, I, I think the uh, door that's signifying and We can't We're not you. catching anything you're saying, Councilmember Valderrama. Hold on. Is that better? A little bit. Is that better? Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, it's better. So basically, it's You're all muffled again. We can't hear you again. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll send you a text. No, we heard you just then. No. Don't move. Okay, well then, implicitly, we are obligating funds by this vote. Thank you. Did anyone catch that? No. He said implicitly we are authorizing funds by this vote. Yeah, okay. How, how is that? How are we implicitly? Council Member of Alderama? Nope. <laughs> yeah, so because you're putting on these items that have to be funded by staff or there's no staff availability. So even though you're going to could be coming back, you're stating that's your intent to look at. I would say my intent would be to allow we the need next to use council. Plates. Sorry. Thank you, Councilmember Stewart. My intent would be to allow the next council to have a chance to weigh in on this, um, particularly given the environmental impacts. David, can I ask a quick question just to, for clarification? Um, will staff be expending time and energy and or budget on if we don't get this? Yes, there is uh, a budget implication for us in terms of staff hours and potentially some very small consultant resources. Uh, we typically would use our existing on-call contracts you would see somewhere in the lines of um, in, in reviewing, assessing these, anywhere from I would say 40 to 80 hours of staff time, and potentially um, five to ten thousand dollars in consultant resource time, just to properly scope something like this. Um, this uh, item three particularly is a really big one for us. Now that's not to say that it is really important. Um, I'd say that out of all of our rule sets, that is the number one priority in terms of updating that. You could also choose to defer that to the upcoming critical areas update, 
which will go through a more thorough, comprehensive <laughs> scoping process for conformity with um, state law, and it will go through its own outreach process, et cetera. Um, but we would very much as staff like to get that done in advance of that because it takes some of the complexity out of that update process. We have really great, um, in terms of comparability to other jurisdictions and in terms of ecology requirements and in terms of best available science, we have very good um, wetland rules and stream rules. The one area in our code that we commonly go back to as um, deficient um, for us, for staff, in terms of efficiently implementing rules is with regard to the various different rule sets we have that relate to geologic hazard areas. So what you're saying is if we dock at this tonight, this order of magnitude around $80,000 is not relative unless we actually take and move this forward. But what you will actually spend is somewhere between 40 to 80 hours of staff time and five to $10,000. Is that accurate? That sounds accurate to me. Okay. Um, and that's just part of the prep to move okay. to the next phase. Very good. Can we break these apart? Uh, nope, that's the motion was them together. So did somebody up there want to talk? A clarification. Yeah, I got a clarification because we're talking 80, but David, I think you said for 1A and 2B was 80. How much is three? So, so again, it, it's broken down um, into phases where uh, the first phase would require uh, staff assessment and scoping. Um, once this is put on the docket, we would then scope it out and then bring it back um, in, in, in an effort to um, narrow the scope and get council endorsement on the scope of work for what we would be pursuing. At that point, we would present to you a budget um, that would go along with that. If it was funds that were available through our existing on-call contracts, or if it was staffing available that could um, that had the technical expertise and the cap capacity to do the work, we would use that first. However, if there was not staff available and if there were no funds in an on-call contract um, because the work is out of scope of that contract or in addition to that contract, we would then come back with an additional budget ask of you at that time, at which point you could determine whether the scope should be reduced or whether this should be tabled for a future um, future work as with something like the, the critical areas update in 2023. Okay. I don't have any more lights on. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. 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 Councilmember Ross, I'm not sure how you voted. I, I said nay. Okay. The nays have it. So that's cell number three too, right? Pardon? That's correct. That means number three we're not going to talk about. That's correct. All right. Okay. So um, can we flip to, let's see, we have three, oh, we have 3A up here. We haven't talked, to, that hasn't been discussed. 3A, 3B, and 3C. So 3A and 3B staff are recommending to integrate as part of the UFMP. At 3C staff, we're not recommending because we feel it's covered through our code, but obviously that's open for your discussion. Or we can move on to the fours. So I'd entertain a motion if someone wants to move this forward. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Is that for all? Yeah, your motion is for, is for the staff three? recommendations or 3A, 3B? For 3A, 3B, for 3A and 3B, um, well, not 3C because we don't need it, so 3A and 3B. Okay. Right. Still second. <laughs> okay. I don't have any lights on. Anyone up in the cloud? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. By vote of 7-0, we'll adopt 3A and 3B onto the docket. More money, but nobody else. Okay. So now we have 4A, 4B, and 4C. Would entertain a motion if anyone wants to move anything there. I move that we uh, move forward with 4B and 4C. Second. 
Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, discussion? Anyone up in the cloud? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, sounds like a vote by 7-0. We will do 4B and 4C for the docket. Can staff clarify one thing? So staff, um, because those are gonna be integrated into the UFMP implementation strategies, they actually don't need to be added to oh, the docket. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> we have to withdraw a motion or something like that? I don't think there's any okay. implication of it doesn't have to be docketed, it All just right. won't be docketed. Okay. Question from the cloud. Is, is that I'm trying to scroll through here because there's not like a logical way to look at these without doing a lot of scrolling. Did we hit everything? Okay. Chris, did you have a question? Yeah, it's the same comment as 3A and 3B. It's part of the urban forest management plan. Is that is that also not necessary to be docketed for the same reason we talked about? Yes. Uh, yes. 4B and 4C. Yes, is what staff's nodding their head. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. So it's nine o'clock. Um, I might suggest a quick break before we dive into the next public hearing. Council? Break? Sorry. A break before we dive oh, into the next. Okay. We'll take a quick break here. Okay. Um, I'm going to get us back on track here. Um, we do have one order of business relative to the docket that we just need to clean up here. And I'm going to have the deputy mayor make a quick motion so we can package it all neatly together. Yes. I would like to make a motion to adopt resolution number 2019-858 as amended by the city council. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, I think that was 6-1. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now we can move on to our next public hearing. Um, this is amending the, shore, the city shoreline master program, uh, which is title 25 of the Smamish Municipal Code. Uh, Mr. Acting City Manager. Uh, Mayor Malcho, uh, yeah. uh, members of the council, David Pyle, community development. We are here tonight um, to discuss uh, the city's shoreline master program, the required periodic review uh, that is to be completed in 2019. Um, the SMP was adopted in 2011. It was last updated in 2017. The periodic review is required in 2019 under state law. Um, there are two categories to these amendments. Um, those are, there are the periodic review required changes as presented to you uh, at the last council meeting on November 12th. There are locally identified proposed changes that were also presented to you on November 12th. Um, the, the path forward to date has included a planning commission work session, a joint public hearing with the planning commission and the State Department of Ecology, a planning commission recommendation that was routed to the State Department of Ecology. Um, the planning commission recommendation was to approve uh, the current proposed draft, which is included in your packet tonight um, as um, attachment um, A to um, exhibit one, which is the draft ordinance. I've also included as a courtesy for your review um, an attachment 1.1 to exhibit one, which is an annotated um, version of the draft code that identifies each of the changes and where it comes from. Um, the Department of Ecology preliminary finding was um, that there were a few uh, minor changes they required and they made a preliminary finding of consistency with state law and with the requirements of the uh, periodic review. With that, I opened up for any questions. Uh, again, the draft is included as um, attachment one to exhibit one. Does council have any questions? Anybody up in the cloud? We still have them? We get, uh, still have a public hearing, right? Yeah. Do you want us to open the public hearing and then have council deliberate? Okay, very good. <laughs> All right. I'm going to open the public hearing. Is there a sign up sheet for that? Sorry. 
I was reading a text message that says, Romero says, it's past midnight here. Not sure how much longer I will last. Yes. I'm still here, though. Okay. Well, if you'll let us know if you end up dropping off, that would be helpful. So we're not trying to get you back if you're not coming back. Okay. So first on the public hearing, I have Chris, is it Tui? All right. I'm not sure your mic's on if you'll just press that button there. Hello. Yep, perfect. Hi, I'm Chris Tui. Um, I live at 24037 Southeast 10th Court, been in Sammamish for 20 years and own a recreational lot down at the base of Inglewood Hill Road. Um, also local business owner, so thank you for the shout out to mm -hmm. small businesses. Um, just wanted to touch base on a couple of things. Is One is uh, the the proposed changes are based on the increase in intensity of the recreational lots. And really as a recreational lot owner, I would argue that they're used less intensely than any other property on the lake. They're used intermittently. They're used occasionally on weekends. They're empty all week. They're empty all winter. There really isn't just an intensity issue on them. Um, if the intention of the proposed changes is to prevent multiple owner lots from using small lakeside parcels, then maybe the plan should address multiple owners and separate from individual residential owners. Um, and then the other is the uh, dock size, and it's kind of a similar, a similar uh, concept is one, I have a small lot and I've been looking um, over the years to build a combined lot with a neighbor on a lot line, which would be less of an ecological um, challenge um, the fish, the Department of Fish and Wildlife like it, the Army Corps of Engineers like it. We just haven't kind of gotten to resolution on it, but to decrease the size of a, of a uh, combined dock from 700 to 480 um, kind of really limits our ability to do that functionally. Um, and again, I think it's in the code changes, it's to address multiple owners of a single lot, but it is an individual owner of a single lot with one family that uses it, it adversely affects kind of our ability to do what we planned with that lot. So I appreciate your consideration on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Next I have Callan DeWald. I think the button, yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so some of my thoughts might be a little disjointed here and I apologize for that, but um, I am a rec lot owner adjacent to you, Chris. Um, and I, I looked through the code um, quite a few times at the proposed changes and for the most part, um, we support them. There are some um, concerns that I have that mirror Chris's, um, but one of the primary concerns that I wanted to bring up um, is that one of the main reasons that they're looking at these code changes is to ensure that we maintain the natural shoreline that we still have left um, and to also provide an avenue. People on rec lots are already putting cabanas and docks, et cetera. This provides an avenue for the city to regulate that um, by putting it through the permitting process, which I think is positive. Um, but there is a larger threat to our um, shorelands and our shorelines that um, I don't think people really know that much about. And I'm not here to argue about the uh, King County Trail. Uh, as we all know, the King County Trail segment 2B has been permitted. Um, but one of the designs that's being implemented in the final segment is that they're removing the ability to place gates and locks on uh, recreational lots. And so these individual rec lots that people have that they lock up, that they use just for their single family, um, the staircases going down to them will be open to the public. Um, and because rec lot owners are not around every night the way that residential homeowners are to keep, keep track of their property and to have security systems, et cetera, um, there's no way to keep trespassers and people from squatting on those lots away from the shorelines. Um, when I brought it up with King County because they're supposed to comply with Sammamish Municipal Code that says that they're supposed to design trails to discourage trespassing and to increase privacy for adjacent landowners. 
Um, they actually stated that the staircases, they have a new policy on gates and that the staircases are no more for private use than they are for public and that they're going to encourage the public to use what they're calling the pub <coughs> public land adjacent to the trail, which is the land in between the improved trail and the rec lots. And so um, they're implying that this kind of linear park, which is about ranges from about 10 to 20 feet between the improved trail and the private shoreline will be open as kind of a unmanaged public park area. And right now, all of that land is in the shoreline setback and it's all natural vegetated area that's adjacent to these rec lots. And right now there's just kind of little trails that go through them that the private landowners use to get to their waterfront. And when that is open for public use, all of that natural vegetated area will get uh, demolished. And one of the issues that they're proposing in this new code for rec law owners when they go to get a conditional use permit is showing their plans for how they're gonna deal with trash and how they're gonna deal, sorry, am I over time? It's okay if you go over a little bit. Um, uh, how they're gonna deal with trash and how they're gonna deal with restroom facilities. Um, but there isn't really any code that is regulating this kind of space in between the trail and the rec lots, how is King County going to manage trash? They're not going to be managing this area that's kind of a um, less formal park than the paved trail is. And it's going to create essentially public dog parks where we currently have private rec lots. Um, one good example would be Inglewood Beach Club. Inglewood Beach Club is a privately owned parcel by the Ingle, members of the Inglewood Platte. Um, they're proposing to put a staircase down there that has no gate on it. Any given owner in Inglewood doesn't know by heart all the rest of the owners. So they're essentially going to be transforming the Inglewood Beach Club into a public park. And I do need you to wrap up though. Yeah, and so as um, two rec lot owners that will be at the base of the staircase that's proposed as closest to the Inglewood Hill parking lot, um, we think that our parcels are essentially just going to become an unregulated public park. And right next to us, there are four King County owned rec lots that they are saying that they're just gonna open up to the public. And there's nothing that differentiates the public lots from the private. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? Couldn't let the opportunity pass you by. You knew I was coming up here, Mary, even though I wasn't on that sheet. <laughs> Uh, I don't oh, know. she wrote her name on the bottom. I'm sorry, Mary. You left all that space. Oh, Mary. <laughs> oh, she beat me. Um, yeah, I don't know if any of the, uh, if what's said, if there's any merit to that, but uh, if it is, man, that, mm -hmm. that opens this whole thing back up. And I mean, to try to prove this tonight that uh, I don't even go there, but there's a clear need for a, uh, uh, I think we should do a, uh, a private beach club with a, with a city, a partnership, so city residents can pay. Sammamish owns a ton more land down there on the lake uh, to allow uh, people to get use. There's a clear need for uh, the public and the Sammamish, uh, similar to, I guess Mercer Island has one. But uh, the dock size, I don't really, I mean the 480 got uh, removed after the public hearing was over, the planning commission, Mark threw it in there late in the game. And I don't really know what the correlation is between having a smaller dock because if people have a boat, it's gonna be out there in the water. Uh, and it's better to have them actually up on a lift on a dock, you know, the sun can go down through, they can be fueled easier, you don't have that environmental concern. Uh, when you have a boat on a dock. So uh, I think uh, we should look at putting that back in. Uh, and then I kind of disagree with uh, some of the discussion last week, which is uh, homeowners having the right to basically plant a tree hedge uh, along the trail. And I, the reason I disagree with that is that's King County property. And they're basically using King County property to I mean, we're not talking about a tree, we're talking about a tree hedge, you know, two, 300 feet up a wall of trees uh, that block view corridors. So I know we won't get it this go around, but I would like to see at least us have that discussion uh, when we talk about the view corridors that are uh, in our code. And I am actually early, so wow, congratulations to me. Mary Wichter.
Hi, my name's Mary Wichter, and I live at 408 208th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish. Um, I printed a map, which I handed out to council. Um, the streams um, layer, you can see, is actually on the Sammamish property tool now. So we had it, but it wasn't on there, and it got put on there, so I wanted to thank Cheryl Paston and her staff and the GIS people and the IT people for having done that. And I just wanted to note some things. So I've kind of highlighted, and you can see my little highlight marks. There's about 20 streams on the west. There's nine or 10 streams to the north, and there's six to eight streams to the south. So I'm gonna specifically speak to the, I respect what the Snoqualmie tribe is requested for having all fish versus just salmonid, um, but I think it really needs to have some study if you're gonna do it. So the concerns I wanted to bring up are um, that if you are going to change a stream definition to F to include all fish, the NP streams are the streams that really don't have any water most of the year, and it doesn't make sense to actually call those streams because they're blocked. It's impossible for fish of any type to get up, and it just really makes sense that you wouldn't need to do it all that. So I think if you're gonna look at the streams, you need to say when something is seasonally dry or you need to look at the amount of flow. And I know Bill Way from the Watershed Company takes a five gallon bucket and they count how much flow during the dry season to do those. You need to look at the water quantity, which is the flow rate. And you also need to look at the water quality because if you look up where James Eastman lives and talks about or has properties, um, there's a ton of storm water that goes in there. So you're sending more water down than there ever was before, but it, it has pollutants in it, it's eroding things that's got a lot of sedimentation. So I think you have to look at the water quality as well. And I think this was brought up by Planning Commission, it was taken off, and if you wanna consider doing it here for council, I think it needs to be put on, they said 2023, 2020, 2021, but because you're impacting like over 40 streams in the city, I don't see her doing this without money spending it, and it's possible that the city would end up having to retrofit these streams based on the change. So while I, um, I champion what the Snoqualmie tribe is asking for and what Pam Stewart said to get this on, I really think that adopting it and having it go in tonight is the wrong thing to do. I think it needs and deserves study because it will impact people, it will impact fish, it will impact the environment, and it will certainly impact your budget and your bottom line. So if you're interested in doing it, assign it later for a work plan item. And we've already seen the dockets that didn't go through um, based on your concern for money. Um, I did send, I, there is some East Lake Sammamish Basin Plan stuff. And um, the other thing that I sent in is I sent in to David Pyle, grandfathering of non-conforming lots. I know that shorelines are for the fourth element, 14th element of the GMA. They are not critical areas, but in the Department of Commerce's critical areas handbook, which is now, instead of 81 pages, 442 pages, there are two things where they talk about grandfathering non-conforming lots, and I don't know if that's a concern to you because it's uh, done under the Growth Management Hearing Board's decision. So I sent it to David, I don't know if he has time to look at it, but I just wanted to make sure that was in for the public hearing. And the last thing, if I have any more time, um, the Urban Forestry Management Plan and the dockets that you did wanna pass from Mary Johnson, I think vegetation is very important. You have to save 80% of trees. There should be vegetation management. We don't want people going into the shoreline and getting rid of the understory and stuff. So hopefully that will get looked at for citywide, including the shoreline in this next year. So thank you for having done those docs. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council during this public hearing? Nope, seeing none, I am going to close the public hearing and turn it over to council. Anybody up in the cloud? And it looks like we've had Romero drop off, just so everyone's aware. <clears throat> I've got a question. I just texted you. Are you getting my text? Pardon? I just texted you. I don't know if no. you're getting my text. Well, only if you're texting on my city phone. Ah, that's the problem. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Am I good to go? I yep. got a couple go of questions for staff. Um, who is there on staff? I'm sorry. I'm we have David up. Pyle at the microphone right now. David. All right, okay. Um, David, can you, I hadn't really thought of until Chris got up of public comment for the hearing, the multiple users versus the single owner. Have you thought about that at all? Uh, was, or was that a thought process as you were going through the proposed changes? Uh, yes, um, if you recall from the November 12th uh, workshop we had on this topic, um, we, we described that there are three general categories of shoreline users that we've identified along the city of Sammamish shoreline. Um, the first category is really simple and that is a one-to-one -one ratio. It's one single family homeowner 
using their single family waterfront lot for the purpose of a residential use. Um, and that, that is a real simple one that's already addressed by our code. Um, the, the next one is a, a many to one relationship um, or even a one to one relationship where you have a recreational lot along the lake that is being used to support adjacent and nearby residential uses. Um, and what's going on there is that there is a direct relationship between those residential uses and that, that lot or tract along the shoreline. Typically that would be accounted for in the form of some sort of homeowners association management agreement. It's incorporated into the face of a subdivision. There is an easement of some sort that might establish a relationship between the, up, the, the adjacent nearby residential property owner and that recreational lot. So what we see is that the primary use is residential and that the modification is used as a, a recreational waterfront lot supporting that residential use. If you recall in shoreline um, rulemaking, they're very specific about uh, shoreline uses being water dependent, water, water oriented or water related. Um, and they are then uh, very specific that only those types of uses are allowed along the shoreline as priority uses and that any modification of the shoreline must only be allowed in in allowance to in support of those uses. So what what happens is you first have to establish what the use is that you're supporting by modifying the shoreline. Um, and then we would consider in our code what modifications are allowed. Um, the third category is the one that we're talking about here. Um, and that is the, the instance where you don't have an adjacent or nearby residential use and you are establishing an independent recreational use, which is appropriate along the shoreline. However, we have a gap in our code that does not address when and how those should be allowed. Um, as a default, the state law d directs that when you have a use that's unidentified, it should be processed as a conditional use permit. That said, we still don't have additional supplemental criteria to help guide us in how these uses should be implemented along the shoreline. So what we've done here is we've identified that we have these uses on the ground and that we are going to continue to see pressure or interest in expanding and improving these lots for the purpose of these uses that are not residential, that are private parks. Um, and we've, we've added criteria to help guide the conditional use permit process such that we are considering things like access, parking, uh, trash collection, um, programming, um, so that if the scale and intensity of the use becomes such that it requires additional consideration and we would then require those types of amenities be added as part of a conditional use process, it would be something that would, as uh, Cal and DeWall was, was identifying, um, would help prevent continual degradation of our shorelines and help keep the character of the shorelines with, that's what they are now. Most of these uses are located in areas that are considered to be urban conservancy um, in our shoreline master program, which is kind of like a zoning overlay. So it's actually inappropriate to see a higher intensity use in those areas. Now to answer the direct question that you had, which was whether or not we considered this um, individual private park user as part of this, yes we did. The implication or the issue that we have is that these, there's nothing preventing these individuals from selling this to a subsequent user, and there's nothing preventing uh, multiplication of interest and ownership on these parcels. So what we've done is we've created a, a safe harbor for those existing uses that exist on the ground today, and we've identified those as grandfathered or um, conforming. So what happens is, is you can continue to operate that existing private park that might have one owner, four owners, 10 owners, um, as it stands today, but the point of which you decide to intensify that use or add amenities um, is the point when we would be bringing you in for discussions around a conditional use permit to set legal parameters around how you can use the property. Okay, so there's no impact to an individual owner right now uh, unless they sell it to a group of 10 people, then those 10 people have to deal with it. Okay, I paraphrased that right, correct? correct. He's nodding his head. All right, very good. Uh, second question, was there, what was the rationale, if any, to limit, the, it was it's only limiting the dock size 480 square feet in Lake Sammamish, but it's still 700 and some number 
on the other two lakes. Is that correct? That's correct. Why? What was the rationale there? Uh, the focus of the conversation was around these recreational use lots. Uh, my understanding is that there, there is at least one of these that is a homeowners association owned parcel um, on Pine Lake. Um, there may be some on Beaver Lake as well, I just don't know. Um, the discussion simply did not go there. Um, the issue was primarily related to the proliferation of docks along Lake Sammamish. And the addition um, was made um, later in the conversation, as was identified by Mr. Eastman here, um, and that was a change that was directed by the Planning Commission. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Okay, I don't have any more lights on. Oh, Councilmember Stewart. Actually, uh, Councilmember Hornish, if I recall from last week when we talked about the the dock size, one of the concerns was that you had a very tiny lot and they would build a large dock which would actually significantly increase the size and potentially the number of people using the property, if I recall from last week. That's correct. So that was part of the rationale. Now, I can't speak to why we're only limiting it on Lake Sammamish and not on the other two, but that- Neither, neither can I. Okay. Deputy Mayor Moran. Um, what is the dock size on the other lakes? 700, 700 square feet. 700. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I, um, I had e uh, emails that came in this week as well questioning why we would have it be smaller on a larger lake um, and, and allow them to be, you know, bigger on a smaller lake. So that's a good question. David, it's just a kind of thinking out loud here. Is there any way to regulate the size of the dock based on the size of the lot to prevent the issue that we're trying to get at, which is having a small lot with a very large dock that would then lead to multiple cars that doesn't have parking and the trash issues that is kind of... Um. <laughs> No. <laughs> without Very without doing some research and some statistical analysis around lot sizes, um, this goes back to a similar conversation to the one we had with the development regulations update and our setbacks. Mm -hmm. How can you have a, a dynamic variable setback in relationship to the home size? Sure. Um, and that took quite a bit of work for us to figure out. Um, in this instance, um, I might also point out that the 480 square feet is a remnant of a prior era where Army Corps of Engineering permitting on Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish um, was far simplified in that so long as you graded your dock, you expanded the pile, the first set of piling to 18 feet um, waterward of the ordinary high water mark and you had a four foot wide walkway and the dock was no longer larger than 480 square feet, that it was essentially um, kind of like a programmatic permit that was really easy to pull from the Army Corps. They've since changed their programs um, and they're very different now, but this is the remnant of um, studies around um, fish uh, habitat impacts. And what happened was um, there was a scientist named Roger Tabor who did a bunch of studies and actually did some radio tagging of fish and mapped out fish migration along the shoreline and identified that the fish were traveling somewhere along the lines of 10 to 20 times further because of um, shaded areas due to docks. So as a result of that, there was a lot of discussion around how to narrow docks, grate them, elevate them, those sorts of things. Um, so that standard of 480 square feet is actually one that is a remnant of a past era, but is still valid. Um, I might also point out that the Shoreline Management Act um, and the enabling legislation in the Washington Administrative Code uh, 17326 is very specific with regard to the fact that a dock is only allowed in support of a primary use, an allowed use, um, and a dock may only be allowed so much as to provide access to watercraft. The purpose of a dock is not to build a um, extension of a patio or a party platform. Mm -hmm. It's for the purpose of accessing a watercraft. So the 480 square feet is in line with that. The origin of the modification made by the Planning Commission came from public comment received during the Planning Commission process on this. 
and that is one of the reasons why it was added. It was a comment made from, I believe, uh, Bill Way and Mark Cross um, related to uh, their concerns over proliferation of oversized docks on Lake, on Lake Sammamish. Very good. Uh, Councilmember Hornish. I'd like to move that we adopt option number two, which is excluding the dock size in our packet for the version of the draft ordinance. I gotta scroll up to option two. Page two. So, option two is uh, adopt amend the amended version of the draft ordinance, excluding the amended dock size restrictions. Correct? Correct. Okay. And I've put a draft of option two in front of you for uh, assistance. Okay, I don't have a second. I'll second it. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Can I speak to it? Yes, you may. Um, I'm not sure it makes sense, especially with the example we heard tonight where they want to build a bigger one in between. We actually gained an advantage, so I don't think, I don't want to cut our nose off despite ourselves uh, for that scenario. But more importantly, um, and what David just read, I, I kind of got a kick out of it. A dock is only for watercraft. Well, the city is violating that right now. Uh, I don't think the city has any watercraft <laughs> in the dock that we built. So, um, <laughs> so I, I just don't see the need to limit it to the 480 on a big lake as such as the Mamish. Thank you. I have a quick question. How big is the docks down there at the landings? For just for perspective on the square footage on those. Do you have any idea? I don't, although just my inclination having looked at them is my guess would be around 1,400 square feet. Oh, that's really big. Whoa. The pair of them or like, because there's one on either side. It's the width and the length that oh. picks up all the square footage okay. typically, um, which is why the RGP3 rule from back in the day required a four foot width and that's how people were able to accommodate the length. Okay. So a 480 square foot dock is pretty short, pretty small. Four feet by 120 feet long. Okay. That's right. pretty long, 120 feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, um, can, so you mentioned that the 480 feet uh, has an effect on the fish. So by not limiting it, do we have any idea what that might do to the kokanee? I mean, I guess at, at this moment, I'd rather err on the conservative side, we can always relax the regulations later. And I appreciate that in, in this particular case, we might have some other impact, but on the whole, I don't think we should be regulating to the exception. Um, I'd like to make sure we're not adversely impacting the kokanee at this point. So uh, the, the, the dock size is also mitigated by other measures, such as elevation, um, which allows the azimuth of the sun to shine at a certain angle, illuminating the water, um, grading of dock surfaces, um, use of uh, certain types of materials. So it's not the only factor that's considered, um, although it, it is known that um, a larger dock causes larger disruption in fish migratory patterns. That's been proven through the Tabor study. Um, and um, going back to the uh, Callan DeWald comment around um, the fact that these lots are primarily located in our urban conservancy environment, which as part of the 2011 Shoreline Master Program update was identified of, as having reaches of higher function, that adding a dock and adding additional development along those reaches of shoreline might further diminish the function of that shoreline and might then cause for an imbalance in our cumulative impacts assessment that was provided to the State Department of Ecology um, in such a way that it would cause some additional degradation of the shoreline to occur in reaches where it was not intended to occur, um, which is another reason why and one of the points raised by the public commenters during the planning commission process of this, uh, that was part of this. So if I can translate that, because that was awesome, but um, that the smaller dock, that the larger docks are proven to have more adverse impacts on fish migratory patterns and that uh, larger docks in these particular areas may have um, 
more uh, negative impacts on those areas in terms of uh, degrading the shoreline. That, 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 that's correct. Okay. And, and if I might offer an alternative here, um, one thing you could do is limit all dock sizes along the urban conservancy environment in the shoreline to 480 square feet, and then revert the dock sizes in the balance of the shoreline residential environments back to what was previously in the code. I would like to amend the motion to what David just said. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Okay, so the amendment has been moved and seconded. <coughs> Council, or Deputy Mayor Moran, you have your light on. Your comments need to, okay. Are there any further comments on the amendment? Yes. Okay, Councilman Hornish. What does that mean? What, the Urban Conservancy, what, what areas is that? Uh, th those are the areas that during the 2011 Shoreline Master Program, um, the city was required uh, by the State Department of Ecology to perform what was called a, um, a shoreline reach assessment, a functional assessment by reach. And what they did was they broke the shoreline up into um, linear reaches um, of anywhere from uh, 1,000 to 3,000 linear feet, and they did um, assessments by boat and by foot. Hey, let, let, me ask a, let, me, let me ask a simple question, David. How many? How much are we talking about that can, would be limited to 480? How many lots? I would bet somewhere in the range of 60 parcels. Wow. Out of how many? I don't know the total number offhand. Um, I, I could pull up a map really quickly and you could see all of those areas. That would be helpful, I think, in understanding. If you, if you could give me one sec here. Sure. Councilmember Hornish and Councilmember Ross, I'm not sure if what? you're able to. Are you able to see? But it's I delayed. Know I know there's a delay. It's not up yet. So I, yeah, it's yeah, it's not up yeah. yet. But I. S <laughs> well, but I, and as you're looking at it, I guess the second question then is how many of those, whatever number, 60 out of 400 on the east side? I don't know. Um, 360 maybe, I'd guess. Um, so almost one sixth of them. How many of those? are privately owned and I'm guessing 60 of all 60 would be. Okay, so I've uh, brought up uh, for your um, viewing pleasure a uh, map of the city's um, shoreline designations. Um, and if you um, look here, the, the pink area on this map, and I can zoom in as needed, the pink area is considered to be um, urban, or uh, excuse me, urban conservancy, and the green area is considered to be shoreline residential. Um, and if you have questions about the basis for that determination that was made back in 2011, I'm happy to provide some more information. I'm trying to zoom into the parcel level so you can see how that might affect uh, the parcels, whoops, um, here. Um, so you can see in this instance, um, the area uh, in pink here would be an area where you would be limiting dock sizes to 480 square feet. These lots are typically smaller. They're typically exhibiting a currently higher functional value in terms of ecological function. They're currently typically more vegetated in character. Um, so that, that would be um, consistent with the idea of trying to limit impacts to those areas by restricting dock sizes. David, I have another question, just based on the fact that one of the parcels is half and half. Were they intended to cover a full parcel or? We've actually um, had to address that. And, in it, it, they were intended to only be assigned by um, geographic reach. It was not related back to the on the ground parcels. So someone gets to pick the length of their deck <laughs> or their dock, excuse me. <laughs> just build it on the right half. Yeah, that's right. All right, Deputy Mary Moran. What does Bellevue do on the other side of the lake? What are their 
do we by chance know what they're uh, what they allow for docks on the other side of the lake? Uh, I was integral in that SMP. It was a, a wonderful five years of my life. Um, and uh, they restrict dock sizes, last I knew, to 480 square feet, but they do allow for joint use docks, um, I think it's 1,000 square feet for adjoining property owners. Um, they also would allow for other use categories such as marina to go in. So say for example, Vassa Park could come in and um, build something larger. Um, uh, they do allow for expanded dock sizes in, in the case where you have um, a medical accommodation requirement. Um, there were several of those that we processed over the years where if you had a doctor's note and you were in a wheelchair, you could have a bigger dock, which makes sense. We understand that. Um, but they generally stick uh, pretty closely to the 480 square foot limitation. Okay, I don't see any more lights on. Um, David, could you scroll down on the map real quick? I'm just curious if it's... So because they did it by linear feet, it's, I, I mean, it, it looks to me about 50% of the lots. Mm -hmm. But they're tiny, tiny, tiny. My understanding is as you get further south... Oh, okay, there's a lot more. It is than. far oh. more... Uh, oh, residential, like, oh, which great. is why I went with approximately 60 uh, parcels. Okay. I appreciate you scrolling down now. Okay, so the basically the entire southern part is, mm -hmm. is residential. Okay. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So the... Not sure where I wrote down my motions and amendments now. Um, so we had Councilmember Hornish made the motion. Councilmember two. Pardon? Yes, and then you've made the amendment to make for the, the pink areas right. be limited to 480. Okay, so we are voting on not that the pink the areas, ago. but what? the um, urban conservancy areas to be limited to 480, the residentials to be 700. That is the amendment, and that is what we're voting on right now. So all those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Nay. Okay, by a vote of 5-1, the amendment passes. Now we will vote on the main motion as amended. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Nay. Okay, by a vote of 5-1, the motion as amended passes. All right. All right, thank you. Trying to scroll back. Oops. So we're squared away, yes? Yeah, what are we going to? <laughs> I gotta fix my iPad so I can see what's next here. Budget. Okay. Our next public hearing is relative to the city's biennial budget. Um, Mr. Acting City Manager. I do have a few comments. Uh, just real briefly, just to summarize what's in your agenda bill, uh, the only budget appropriation we need from the council relates to the IT related items in the technology fund. What I'm saying is the existing appropriation, whether it's the budgeted contingency in each fund or expenditure savings, meaning budget, uh, unspent budget, can cover the items we discussed last week. Now, to be clear, what's not included is the police services study. I'm recommending that we address that during the budget process next year. And also, as you know, will note in the uh, agenda bill that uh, our recommendation on the human services uh, proposal was to uh, process that further and bring it back to the council in the first quarter of next year likely at the February 11th joint meeting with the Human Services Commission. One other thing, there was a number of comments made uh, regarding uh, TNIP for the council's consideration, some service level reductions, with given that we talked about this last Tuesday and the agenda bill for tonight was due last Wednesday, mm -hmm. there wasn't time to seriously consider that. That, that really deserves to be uh, thoughtfully addressed during the budget process next year. And with that, public hearing is needed. Okay. So I will open up that public hearing and we'll see if there's a sign in.
you. <laughs> okay. So Mary Wichter. I saw you that you signed up even all the way at the bottom because you were the only one that signed up. <laughs> I was I missed just you last trying time. to allow anybody else to speak. My name is Mary Wichter, and I still live at 408 208th <laughs> Avenue Northeast in Spanish. And I did email this one in. Um, so what I'm asking is something simple. I'm not asking you to spend any more money. What I would like is that you create a new fund, and I was told this by um, city staff. You need to create a new fund called abatement, abandonment, and I would also add restoration opportunities. And then you have the general fund and you would simply transfer money from the general fund into it. And the type of monies that you would do is you already heard tonight from multiple people concerned about vegetation and trees getting wiped out and things getting hurt. When that happens, the city collected 150,000, then 300,000, and I hear almost 500,000 now, where people are just taking out trees and they're hurting the landscape. And then nothing is ever done to fix that or replenish it. That money, which is enforcement money from code violations, simply goes into the general fund and it could be spent on anything. So since it's actually supposed to be something to kind of help the city, it makes sense that you'd create a pot for that to be able to use those monies. And the couple things are is like um, David Pyle had said, sometimes there's very poor construction happening or people that get these really crazy lots that you're gonna keep building on. And uh, during the winter time, the erosion control isn't happening, the city can't go in and do anything. And maybe if it's a really bad safety or health risk, they'll go in and abate or abandon. Um, so if you have these monies, the city can do things to go fix the area and help. And then there's also places like there are homeowners associations that have an HOA lot or people that are individuals that have a lot and a lot of blackberries have grown over but they'd like to be able to fix that. So instead of the, just them going and doing the right thing with their own stuff, they'd be able to go to the pot of money and say, hey, if we work on this, could we get some help or volunteers or some plantings or something? Because in the urban forestry management program, it says over 51% of the forests that we have in the city are in private lands. So you need to do them for, um, for like public private partnerships. And I know Fort Terra is mentioned in the urban forest management plan, but like I'm trying to do Washington native plant steward things. There are people that you can use. So what we're trying to do is instead of just enforcement money, which is up to $500,000 now just for trees, instead of that just going to the general fund, some or all of it or whatever you guys would choose at council's pleasure, you would create a new fund called abatement abandonment. And I put the definitions in the email for you and restoration opportunities. And then those funds could be available to see how they could be used to try to either fix things that need repair for safety or for things that have gone bad or that people could do the right thing and try to fix. And you could look at the amount that gets in there every year and the amount that comes out, you could change it, but you until you have that fund set up, all the money's just gonna roll into um, the general fund and there won't be any fixing or repairing or restoration. So it just really makes sense to me. I brought this up a couple years ago. I had thought it could be done and then I had been told, no, there has to be a new fund created that you would fund from enforcement money. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address council during this public hearing? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing and turn it over to council. Uh, council Member Hornish. I'd like to move that we adopt the budget as proposed by staff with the increased 120,000 for IT. Okay, I don't have a second. I'll second it. Okay, it's been seconded. Uh, discussion, Council Member Hornish, did you wanna to speak to it? Um, I, I think we had a good discussion last week on the uh, budget, and I think staff understood where we're at. This doesn't mean that we're limited to what we can spend, and there's some further discussions that I think we had. We need to have, um, and we still need to talk about whether or not the taxes are increased or not. Although this budget, as adopted, would, would not have the, the built-in one percent, but we still have an option to maybe raise that in the next uh, next matter that we'll be discussing. Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, I would like to propose an amendment and that is that we add the two counselors um, that the Human Services Commission and the community um, has requested. We have, we have kids in crisis um, 
we had a joint meeting with the Issaquah School District. Um, we've heard from uh, a number of agencies that uh, our kids are in crisis. Drugs uh, and the drug issues are a symptom of that. Um, we have heard from some of the experts that when a, when a child is in crisis, particularly our teens, uh, that it is crucial that they get in to see a counselor right away. If they have to wait two weeks, uh, they will often then choose not to talk with that counselor that it's too late. When they come and ask for help, we need to be there. Um, I think it's really critical. I think it is not a, a huge sum of money. Uh, I am not looking at spending money frivolously, but we are talking about the lives of our children here. Okay, so we need a second yeah, before second. we can debate this. And yep. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Councilmember Ritchie. So I would like to uh, I would like to amend uh, the motion to add those two counselors. I appreciate the Human Services Commission uh, looking at ways that we could possibly cut that in half. Um, my one concern would be that um, being able to uh, hire counselors for less than a year, I would be concerned that we wouldn't actually be able to get counselors in if we didn't have at least a year commitment uh, to cross path. Um, but I'm certainly open to anything. I, I just, uh, we've heard that the holidays is one of the most crucial times of the year where kids are, are under stress. Um, and I just think it would be irresponsible of us to do nothing at this point. We, we heard from the community uh, for months now that they want us to act. Uh, this is a, a very small step that we can take, but it's something we can do. Um, so there it is. Councilmember Hornish. No, I'm sorry, um, disregard that. Okay, Deputy Mayor Moran. This is a, um, a big issue for many different reasons. Um, yes, we have many kids in crisis, um, and there's something that uh, that everybody should do, the community should do. This is not a city issue, this is a community issue. Um, we are not providers. We do not um, employ providers. We are not a provider city. Uh, to just spend money for the sake of spending money has never been a good idea. The idea that we would, um, that we would just throw money at something uh, without having a check and balance in place to me um, is just amazing. Um, to me, you need to work with the school districts. We met with the school districts. They talked about partnering with us. Um, I don't, I, where is that in this equation? Has anybody sat down with Lake Washington yet? No, we haven't. Um, you know, we look at, um, I was lucky enough to have uh, lunch on Saturday with a friend of mine who's, who works with the, the group of the counselors through the Lake Washington School District. We need to be connecting with them. Um, our kids go to different places up here. We should be connecting with all of those places. The idea that um, we would buy a person, I think is wrong. Um, we should buy hours, we could buy sessions, but that we would in any way say that kids should go to one location is not gonna happen. Um, I think that we, uh, we need to open up and, and actually look at where our kids are going, analyze that a little bit better, because that's kids are not going to go to just one location up here. And we need to look at the patterns of what's already happening and try to make that available for them. I am not against helping the kids. I'm not against um, working and, and having um, sessions available for youth. I do think that especially with Christmas time, and with the holiday time, I know that gets to be really hard for many people. But um, when I sat and I spoke with um, the folks from, I sat with um, the chair and the vice chair from that committee, this was not even on their, their list last week. So uh, this became a number one priority after it was brought up at their meeting. So let's not have a knee-jerk reaction. 
let's think about what we can do and how we can look at something and how we can see it, how we have some sort of uh, balance, check and balance in place and look and see how it works and or if it doesn't work. Maybe the kids won't respond to it. We don't know that until we try it first. And um, I think we should try it, have it vetted, run it through the Human Services Committee um, and let them do that. Let them do their job and do and answer a billion questions that we all have. Thank you. Um, so two things. Um, first off, um, from a process standpoint, Councilmember Stewart, I respect your motion. I, I approve your motion. I support your motion. I think on this motion, it gets a little confusing just in terms of how we do process. The motion, just for Lita's sake and who's ever sitting in the uh, deputy clerk seat, we need to keep our motions very, very specific. And then I think to the credit of the mayor, she will come back and say, would you like to speak to your motion? So I just think going forward, it kind of helps us understand, here's my motion, one sentence, period. Would you like to speak to it? Yeah, here's why I think it's a good idea. Just that's just a procedurally, because I'm nitpicky that way, and I feel bad that you're trying to pull emotion out of all that. So, um, so taken. what is my my overarching point about where we're at here is that it's my understanding that there's a couple different variables, or a couple things we can do now, and then a couple things we should be doing in February at the joint meeting. And then looking at this going forward, and the things that jumped out to me were a couple points that when I spoke to folks, the, the, the two key points that jumped out to me that still stick in my head that make me want to support this motion. One, I understand there's a multiple week wait to get to people for counseling sessions within the city of Sammamish. I think that's a, a failure on our part for not doing something about that if we don't support this motion. This is not a panacea. This is not a silver bullet that's gonna fix everything. This is something we can do right now. It's something that we can apply some resources to right now to cross paths so that we know that we can add some qualified individuals to help what is clearly an emergent issue in our, in our schools and amongst our, our, our citizens and our kids. Um, I'm lucky enough if, when my kids have issues, they are, we can go to a doctor's office. We have vehicles. We can hop in a car. We can go to where the doctor's office is, whether it's Virginia Mason or what Swedish. We can go. Not everybody has that capability. Cross paths is walking distance to all of our high schools. It's right there. And I think it's really important that they have stepped up. They've created this space. They identify the, the gap in time. That's who I understand said, hey, we are not able to see people, and we're sending them to Redmond and Issaquah. And while I appreciate that there are services available in our larger community, what we as the council can do to work within our jurisdiction, our municipality, is to apply some resources right now because of the emergency situation we're dealing with, with the op opioid ec epidemic, that is not getting better and I don't know that this is gonna fix it. I don't think it will. What it is is something we can do right now to help our kids. The second thing that jumps out to me, other than just getting back and forth these things, and let's plug some people in right now and go revisit this, is the, the overarching goal of trying to do something rather than nothing. If the option is wait till February, my mind goes to, okay, the rest of November, December, January, three months of What's gonna be going on? I just, I wouldn't wanna think there's something we could have done. We could have had folks available through our resources. In my mind, a relatively small investment, a verifiable investment, a Sammamish-based investment. These are two counselors that are gonna be available in Sammamish, helping Sammamish kids deal with issues in our Sammamish high schools and our Sammamish middle schools. Our Sammamish kids will not have to go off the plateau to get these services by simply adding two people. Now, more to Councilmember Moran's point, I don't think this is throwing money at something. I think this is an investment, but I respect that it does not have the checks and balances and we need to look at it again in February. I think we should look at it again over the summer. I think we should be constantly looking at how we are investing into our human services, not as a one-on-one -on -one -to -one versus our other cities and other local municipalities that are not contract cities. We are a contract city. We shouldn't be saying Wissacaw spends X number of dollars per person and we spend Y. It's that are we able to determine whether or not the services that we need are available to our citizens? 
And right now, it's my understanding that they're not. And we can do something about it right now. It's a minor investment with a major potential payback. And I would be in favor of doing something now rather than spending the next three months hoping and praying that something horrible doesn't happen so some kid doesn't have the resources available to him. That is why I support this motion. Councilmember Hornish. Uh, yeah, hopefully I'm not on you. Yeah. Um, I actually would like to spend a million dollars if I knew it could save a life. The problem I have is we just don't know. Uh, I would spend two, three, four million dollars if I knew it could save one life, to be perfectly honest with you. The trouble is we're trying to balance this because we, have, we don't have unlimited funds. We're dealing with taxpayer dollars. And once you start paying for something, it's now built into the budget going forward, which I don't like if we don't know exactly what we're doing. I think we still need to pull back, figure out where to spend it, how to spend it. Just not now. I do agree that we need to do something. Just not now. We get, we're getting conflicting information as to whether or not uh, we have the capability or don't have the capability. Um, you know, and, and Councilmember Ritchie, you just mentioned the opioid crisis. This additional funding that we're voting on doesn't deal anything with the opioid crisis. It's only mental health. So the question I have, are we spending it in the right place by doing this one? Um, so I just can't support this motion, but I can certainly support some increased funding as we go through a process without making a, a reactionary decision with taxpayer dollars that's going to be, we're going to be stuck with going forward uh, here on out. Thank you. So um, while I support the idea of um, allocating funding for this issue in our community, um, I can't support the amendment as made because I believe that there may be a better use of the funds and we don't know what that is because this does feel a little bit like a knee-jerk reaction. Um, Council had a deliberation on Tuesday and I believe it was on a Thursday that the Health and Human Services Committee was deliberating on the topic that wasn't on their agenda. And then staff's recommendation actually says to wait on this. So I, I have some confusion, I guess, as to exactly how this has all come to be. But I do support some funding for it, but I will not allocate it directly for cross paths because we don't know that cross paths is where the money needs to be spent. Um, maybe the Health and Human Services Commission says, and maybe maybe they say that that um, counselors are exactly what we need. And if that is the case, and they fully vet that, then that's fine. Um, but maybe they land on a different answer or pair of answers where funds that this council allocates could be. So I will not be supporting the amendment, and I'll be making another amendment if it doesn't pass. So. Councilmember Stewart. So I'm not sure where the conflicting information is coming from. All of the information we have is that uh, in Sammamish, we have a wait, a wait time for counselors. Uh, one of the biggest issues that our teens face, particularly our older teens, is that they are overstressed and overscheduled. And so expecting them to be able to drive to Redmond or to Issaquah is part of the problem because time is part of their problem. They're stressed out. Uh, cross paths, as I understand it, having spoken to members of the Human Services Commission, has stepped up and said that they that they can support the additional hours. And so, while I don't believe we're really talking about buying people, we are talking about buying, you know, 1,200 to 2,400 hours of of therapy time. And that does not just address mental health; those therapists also uh, address. Uh, drug use and drug addiction as well. Um, Youth Eastside Services, Cross Paths, all of these counseling agencies address all of these issues, and these are the issues that are plaguing our children. We know statistically that our kids are considering and, and attempting suicide at a higher rate than the state average. And so I agree, this is not a panacea. Uh, this is not the only thing we need to do, but this is something that our counseling agencies, our Human Services Commission, and our, you know, our kids and our parents. I don't know how many emails we got just today. You know, this this <coughs> bill only went up, you know, what two days ago. We got probably 20 emails today from the community asking us to support this. 
You got more than four, because I, I made sure that Melanie and the entire council was copied on, on many. So I, I, just, I just think it's important that while I don't know if doing this will save a life, I know that not doing this will leave kids in distress, and kids in distress can do dangerous things. And this doesn't, this won't just help us with drug addiction, this will help us with bullying, with suicide attempts, with all sorts of, of potential issues. So I, I fully support bringing on counselors. I also support the, the Human Services Commission saying that let's, let's put some measurements around this. Let's make sure that as we allocate this, that we, that we collect the usage met, metrics on this, and we make sure that these, that these counselors are being utilized, that they're being fully utilized, and we can reassess this at the next budget cycle and make sure that, that these uh, counselors are being utilized. But I just, I just think we need to do something for our kids. They're asking for it. We've, we've already gone. I mean, I appreciate that we, should, we could do more and we could study more, but we've already been two and a half months since we had the second overdose death, and we haven't done anything. So what makes us think that between now and February 11th, we're going to do something different? Um, I, I think that you know we as a council, we like to have data and we like to study things, and I think that's great. But at some point, you have to take action, and, and we can't get stuck in analysis paralysis when we're talking about our kids' lives. Deputy Mayor. Can I move to extend to 1045? Uh, thank you, Council. Second. All those in favor? The Senate at 1045. Aye. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. By a vote of 5 1, we are extending to 1045. Okay. Deputy Mayor Moran. I think we all are on the same page and trying to do something for the kids. I think we're, or the youth. I think we're all on the same page for, um, I think the difference is coming in on how we handle it. Um, to say nothing is being done, I can tell you that's not true. I know the, the schools are doing a lot. Um, as far as us partnering with them, I think we're, we're kind of missing the boat on that because we should be working with them much closer. Um, and one of the things that's not happening um, is something the schools are moving forward on is drug education. So. Um, that is something that I do think that um, if I were going to put a dollar amount on, I would say we should be doing. Um, because without education um, and telling the kids what to stay away from and what to look for and, and what's on the street and, and what exactly is going to kill you first time you try, um, I, I think that education would be pretty smart. Um, so I, I really, I have... Uh, I, I again, I'm going to. I will vote against this, um, only because I, I am I'm not against spending some amount of money, but um, I am against um, the amount that is that this motion is for. Okay. We got one more late, Councilmember Ritchie. Just as a suggestion, I don't know if this is possible, but would it be possible to uh, to structure this so that it, just from a budgetary perspective? Would it be possible to structure this so that it is a, a one-time grant, a one-time spending grant that would go from X date to Y date, whenever that would be, so that we could maintain some level of control over it and that this the, 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 the human services folks, again, I don't understand their structure entirely, but they could come back and, and speak to what would... Can oh, I, sure. So oh. I'm looking for an answer. I'm just rambling okay. on. Okay, so can, can we have... Um, Stan, can we have you come up to, sorry, I'm going to put you in. So this was actually a discussion that took place um, with Tom and Stan uh, from Human Services and myself yesterday just as a, hey, can we come up with a middle ground? And here's just an idea um, that was kind of a middle of the row, and I'm going to let Stan kind of throw well, it out there. I'd like to bring staff up as well to answer any questions that they may be able to add to it. Um, as far as meeting and trying to find something that would work, we were looking at 1,200 hours, which is basically cutting the original request in half. Um, I hate to say number of people and everything else, but it would basically work out to one counselor for the full year, 
We could evaluate it along the way to make sure we have measurables, to make sure that it is working. This counselor is dual trained in drug and alcohol abuse as well as mental wellness. So if we can't get the 170, we have to do something. If, if we have to settle on half, we'll settle on half. But when we look at the numbers and we look at the damage to our community and to our young people, the holiday season's coming up. And if any of you have ever dealt with suicides or family depression, this is the time of year it's gonna happen. This is the biggest time of year. And then at the end of the school year, it's gonna be another one. Right. So, can I ask I'm questions? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but Council, I, I I hate to do this. We are we have a, a an amendment and we have to stay focused on that. We're starting to stray a little bit. Okay. We need to come back to our amendment. So what's the amendment? The amendment was Councilmember Stewart's amendment to add these two um, counselors for $170,000. We need to vote on that. We've I would gone like to round offer an amendment to the amendment. No, Can we I do need that? to I think what we need to do is vote on the amendment. <laughs> And I have one locked and loaded to go to, so we need to vote on this first. So is my you. is my speaking to the you the are, you can speak only to the amendment on the floor, which is the two counselors. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Go ahead. I, I'm. We we're straying away when we we're talking about changing uh, to hours and halving it, and that's why I'm trying to just keep us focused on. We need to take a, a vote on this. So, uh, gone two rounds. <clears throat> My, my uh, hope is that we can find a way to be physically responsible and maintain a level or create a new level of service given the time of year and given the need. And what I'm asking is based upon the motion and the amendment to the motion, or I guess the amendment that Councilmember Stewart suggested or offered, um, is there a structural way from a, a a granting perspective, I, I guess I'm asking the human services and staff folks, is there a way to structure this so that it is not a reoccurring charge and that we can essentially plug some people in right now and then have it be something that is essentially a year's worth of grant, but that it is not a reoccurring charge? Oh, here comes Aaron. I mean, I, I think that's on point. I, yeah, that anyway. There you go. So the, we're actually talking about the budget ordinance is the base motion. So the amendment to that is to add to the budget 170,000. So it's for the purposes. So from a budget standpoint, that, that appropriation would be in effect for the 2020 period. Only. And that's it. Yes, that's so the that's only, right. the only thing that the budget's in effect for. That's what I'm, uh, okay. Yes, so it Thank is not you. a reoccurring charge at this point. We're not doing a 2021 the, at this yes, point. Yes, that's no, all it is. It's just through the remainder of the year, or the remainder of the budget. It's an amendment right. to the yes. current budget. 2020, yes. 2020. You'd have to reallocate 2020. 2020. Yes. The current biennial budget. So it is not a reoccurring charge okay. at this point. So that answers my question. So it isn't a reoccurring budgetary draw or something that's, okay. So uh, I will just continue to support it and go from there. Thank you. I'm gonna make one comment on that, which is that it, is in essence like a reoccurring charge. If you're hiring additional counselors, it's very hard to pull those back if that's not the right use of our funds. Okay, so nope, that would be three times. We're going two well, rounds. <laughs> but that's, we're not hiring anybody. You put me in the soup. You're allocating budget to cross paths. That's right, we are not okay. hiring anybody. Councilmember Hornish. Yeah, and once it's on the line item budget, it, it happens to reappear in the next uh, yep. buy in and you do. I'd like to call the question. Yep, we have no more lights. All those in favor of the amendment, which is adding two counselors, say aye. 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 Opposed. Nay. 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 Okay. Nays have it. Okay. I'd like to offer an amendment. Um, my amendment would be to allocate $150,000 in grant funding that the Health and Human Services Commission can study and allocate for the best use um, in our community if they see it as so fit um, for counselors, so be it. Okay, don't have a I'll second. second okay. I'll second for discussion. Thank you. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Okay, the, I'll speak to my motion. The reason I wanna allocate some money is we do need to do something, but I wanna make sure that it is not the same thing. What I wanna make sure is that the Health and Human Services Commission has adequate time to engage the school districts. I, I read the note, only one school district was engaged in this. What I read from our, um, our commission chair was that 
one of the top things that they discussed that they wanted to do was they wanted to be proactive and not reactive. This feels reactive. What if the answer is not just adding counselors? What if the answer is education for parents, for kids? Um, I want to make sure that we're using these funds the best we can for these kids. I'm a parent too, um, and I, I want to see a positive impact. I just want to make sure that by allocating funds that we are making the getting the biggest bang for our buck for our children in our community. Okay, I don't have any more lights on. Okay, Councilmember Ritchie. I guess there's a question for Aaron. Um, maybe a stupid question, but that's okay, I guess, right? We're trying to learn how to do this a way or right way, wrong way. Um, is there a, based on the mayor's motion of, I mean, different dollar value or dollar amount, a grant versus a budgetary allocation for and within the biennial budget? Was there a, how does that, how, what's the difference? Uh, so what I'm interpreting is you're adding uh, or asking for additional authorization of 150,000 in expense, right? So that's, that's the same base type of amendment to the budget. So budget appropriations that we're currently dealing with are for the 1920 biennial period, and the amount has changed from the prior. So, so 150,000 in additional expenditure appropriation is my understanding of the amendment. So, which would carry with it the legal appropriation timing right. of the 2020 of the period of 2020. Yes. So, but from a, a procedural standpoint, what we're and I don't want to put words in the mayor's mouth. I guess I'm trying to understand, functionally speaking, as opposed to writing a check to cross paths from the city of Sammamish, we're writing it, we're giving it to this, the Human Services Commission and giving them the ability to give out the grant to the folks that they see fit based upon what they see fit, <laughs> when they see fit, to whom they see fit, and when they see fit. Is that a fair statement? That's pretty fair. Yeah. Okay. I want, I, I, you know, I just want to be sure that they have fully engaged and by engaged, I mean not just one district, both districts, and have um, can allocate those funds to in the best place. And that proactive, that was the first thing on that list. Let's be proactive. I, I appreciate that. I think Councilmember Sue is being proactive. I think you're being proactive. I think we're all trying to react to a very horrible situation and trying to be proactive against it happening in the future. I'd like to offer an amendment. $150,000 seems insufficient to me. I'd like to make that $250,000. Okay, so we already have an amendment on the floor. I think we need to vote on the amendment because remember there's still the main motion hanging out there. So we need to vote down this one and then you can make your amendment if it gets voted down. Okay. Okay, I still have other lights on though. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm trying. Okay, I've got you. So I'd like to understand, um, again, structurally, uh, are we are we saying that this money could not be spent until 2020? It would not be available today. Is that correct? It's all an allocation for 2020. So none of that would be able to be able to get to cross paths to be able to bring anyone in before the holiday. Yeah, so the base motion is on the 1920 budget. And so the, the ordinance that's in front of council is adding appropriation authority to the 1920 budget. So that's what the amendment does is make right. that appropriation 150,000 in additional expense. But it doesn't limit it to being spent starting January 1. It could be starting now, is that correct? Yeah, it's a 1920 biennial budget. So. And then I would like clarification on the motion. Are you saying that the Human Services Commission could not turn around and give that money to cross paths, that they have to do additional research? Is that what you're saying? I would like the, I would like to be sure that they have fully engaged. I didn't the, ask that. Are yeah. you requiring them to do that? Or if they chose, they could still go and ha ask cross paths to hire in counselors if they thought that that was the best course of action at this moment? I think, I again, what I said when I was making the motion is I think they need to fully study and, and vet this, make sure that they are spending it in the best place. If they feel like they've done that, I believe, do they have a meeting scheduled in December or not? Do they meet once a month? Is that correct? The commission meets once a month except for August. So it's the second Wednesday of the month. Okay. So they could potentially then still allocate that money in or December. Or if they think that getting a counselor or two in seats before the holiday season, they could do that. 
if that's what okay. the commission chose. Okay, um, Mr. City, Acting City Manager, excuse me. Thanks, Mayor. I just wanted to have Mike Sugg just provide some perspective on this granting idea. Mike. Right, so our, uh, our regular grant process is a biennial process, so it aligns with the budget. So our human services grant process goes from 2019 to 2020. So we're in the second year of the grant, uh, uh, grant process as we are with the budget. I think um, the difficulty with uh, uh, allocating grant money for the Human Services Commission to allocate is that, um, uh, is that we don't have a process for a mid-biennial uh, application. So we would need to, I think, go through um, some brainstorming about how we begin to accept applications from the organizations for the Human Services Commission to consider in 2020. Um, and then once we get those applications, it will take a little bit of time for the commission to review, consider, and get those contracts in place. So just a few points to consider as far as timing goes for 2020. Okay. Councilmember Hornish. Uh, that was interesting. I hadn't thought about that uh, issue, Mike. Thank you. Um, I mean, can we put parameters around that uh, to say here's the grant money, but you've got to do basically an RFP from the recipients and tell us what, how you're going to do it, what you're going to do? Is that what you're saying would be our normal process in the grant process, right? Right, so normally with the uh, grant process, it's a share one app, it's a shared application portal that all the cities use mm -hmm. and the organizations go through and submit proposals for funding and then the, the cities in that uh, shared application pool uh, dictate how those will be, uh, how their funds will be allocated. I do believe that some cities for certain special projects uh, will put out an RFP, a request for proposals uh, for specific services that they're looking for, is that? And we could we could we could do that, or the, the the commission could decide to do that. A little more work, a little more effort in the process, but they could then really study to determine where that you get the best bang for the buck for what we're trying to do. Um, but it's a it's a it's a different process than the normal. As long as they would do that, I, I think I could support this. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Ross, did I hear you in there too, or no? No. Yes, okay. yes, please. Okay. Yeah, I, I definitely think this needs to follow follow our normal grant process. It it'll be increasing funds. I I'm, I'm very reluctant to start bringing converting from an indirect model to a direct model when we start telling or appropriating funds to an, a service provider and say we're paying for your counselors or labor is starting to go away from our model of bidding for need or, or I'm requesting our justifying need in our total grant money bucket. This is a, a motion to add to that money to allow our service providers each year to justify the needs of our community, which may shift year to year. So we don't want to get locked into one use that becomes inefficient and, and trying to lock into, into um, headcount and other resources that are hard to pull back on from an organizational perspective. So it's really about optimizing our human services indirect model and providing grant money to those in most need. And I guess what I didn't see, and maybe Rita and Mike can help me, is I didn't see any grant from the September allocations to cross path. So that's also a little bit curious that now all the, uh, we have they're the number one uh, service provider for some of those needs that were addressed in the last allocations. So it, it really, it also has to tie into the fact that our school districts have multiple cities feeding into them. So we need to make sure that we're marching together in a coordinated manner to ensure that we're not taking all of the financial burden that we're sharing in that burden across our school districts and cities that feed into the school districts so that we're having the best result for the community, the best result for the area and the schools that are feeding into the city. So I support going some funding this direction, which allows us to 
continue our efforts to optimize our grant distributions to the service providers that provide the best um, results for our community. Okay, I don't have any more lights on. So again, we're voting on the one more, one more question. I got one more question okay, on that. I'm oh, sorry. Council Member. This just brought up a point that I, um, sorry, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Um, Chris just brought up a point I, I hadn't really thought of. Can we make it clear, and I don't know if we need to modify the motion or whatever, but some of this money could go to go to the schools. It doesn't necessarily be a not-for-profit not if the Human Service Commission thinks that might be the best way of helping our students. Yeah, I think the, I, I mean, I don't have it in front of me the way I um, stated the motion, but it was just allocating an additional $150,000 in grant funding. I probably should have stated in that that it would have been earmarked for um, youth mental health, but I certainly didn't exclude anyone or anything from getting that grant money. Right, and that just kind of gets to the process that Mike brought up as far as who can apply for it um, if, if the commission is going to go through that process. Um, but if it's clear that the school, this might be money that could go to the schools and their education, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I, I think that would be great. Okay, Council Let the commission figure it out. <laughs> Council Member Stewart. Do you guys have a, any rough idea about how long this process will take if we try to implement this now for this sort of mid-year or mid-buy grant process? Our estimate would probably be probably be about three to four months. You'd have to develop the RFP, put it out, uh, allow time for um, applicants to develop their proposals. Uh, commission would need to review that over one, maybe two meetings. Um, and then we'd need to get the contract in place once that determination was made of where the fund should go. Um, so roughly three to four months, it's it's hard to say because it's a new process for us. Okay, so we definitely wouldn't be getting any assistance for the holidays. It uh, doesn't appear that way at first glance. Um, but, okay. Yeah. And we may or may not get it in time for the end of school year. I can't say for certain. Right. Okay, thank you. Were we certain we were going to get counselors here in the next week if we had allocated $170,000? I believe the estimate from CrossPath was that as soon as the funds became available, it would take them approximately four to five weeks to recruit a consultant. So it wasn't going to be an immediate get on either front, unfortunately. Okay, I don't have any more lights on. So all those in favor of the amendment, which again is $150,000 in grant funding for the Health and Human Services Commission. Um, and I will say that it's earmarked for the purposes of youth mental health. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, I think that was six zero. Now we're um, going to um, look at the main motion as amended. Councilmember Stewart. Um, I would like to add uh, an amendment for the part-time staff uh, for the Healthy Communities Coalition. So speaking directly to the concerns that were raised here at the dais that we need to be partnering with our school districts and all of our community organizations uh, and our, our Human Services Commission. Uh, we made a commitment to, uh, when we had our joint meeting with the Issaquah School District, that our Healthy uh, Communities Coalition would take the lead on uh, developing a framework and a work plan to pull all of that together. And my understanding is that in order to do that, uh, they will need some assistance in additional staff. And so I would like to make the amendment that we add, uh, I think it was $53,000 for part-time staff person. And Mike has something to say there. Right, so that uh, the recommendation for support for that community meeting collaboration and facilitation no. was in the budget recommendation slide that came to you uh, at your study session last Tuesday. And staff uh, still need some additional time to consider 
whether the facilitator and coordinator of those community meetings would be done through a community services officer, a staff member, or potentially through a contract. So there was a line item in that recommendation slide from last Tuesday that was $150,000 uh, earmarked for potential meeting support with the understanding that we would need to do a little bit more research to determine who would be the responsible person for that. The uh, half-time administrative support for human services was uh, uh, merely just staff support to uh, assist uh, the community services coordinator with processing grant paperwork, preparing items for commission meetings, things like that, to free up her time so that uh, she can do what she does best, uh, which is outreach and engagement with the community. So the, the half-time administ administrative assistant um, was a little bit different than what we were thinking would be the resource to run the uh, the, the community meetings. Okay. I hope so that makes sense. I think what it, what I heard you say is that we would need one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for that that community coordination. That was the estimate in the budget recommendation slide. The one hundred fifty thousand correlates to the cost of a community services officer. So we were kind of considering the worst case scenario. Or, excuse me. The most the most expensive scenario of the uh, community meeting facilitation support would be that CSO. Yeah, I, I, I'm not supportive of that in talking to the potentially the new uh, chief of police. He was not supportive of that being through the police department. So I think we need to be looking at that through staff. So I would like to stick with the part-time uh, staff position right now to provide you additional staff. Um, to help with that, and if you find that you still need an additional person, we can address that at the budget um, next year. But for now, that would still give you additional staff uh, capacity to start this coordination because we do need to be coordinating across. Councilmember Stewart, we don't have a second yet. Sorry. And this is more appropriate for after right. a second. 50, Thank you. So I, I move that we add $53,000 to the budget for part time staff person to assist human services. Second. And, and again, we made a commitment to the Isqua School District that the city would take the lead to coordinate across the school districts and across all of the community organizations to develop a work plan, that there was a framework proposed by uh, the president of the Isqua School District that we look at that framework uh, and, and see how we could modify that framework to work for the city of Sammamish because we do have multiple school districts and it was determined that either the school districts have to coordinate across multiple cities or cities have to coordinate across multiple school districts. And as was raised by the Issaquah School District board members, this is a community problem, not just a school district problem. They would obviously be our primary partners in this, but it is not just a school problem. The, the kids in Sammamish who overdosed were not at school when they overdosed. This is not just a school problem. Deputy Mayor Moran. I guess I had a different read from that meeting. Um, Council Member Ross, are you still online? I am. Didn't you have a... Uh, I had a reverse break. Pardon? Go ahead, go ahead, Council Member. Didn't you have a, a conversation with the um, president of the school board regarding that? Yes, and, and it still is. Um, the school district is taking, like to take the lead. We're supportive, and and we have a lot of coordinating to do across the schools and the cities. And so it's not, it was not uh, delegated to the cities to take the lead on all of this. They're asking, ask, can we come up with seed money of sorts? Uh, but once again, in our my side conversation with the president was that, well, to establish seed money, we need to do it in a coordinated fashion so not one city is carrying the entire um, financial responsibility. Okay, I don't have any more lights on. Councilmember Hornish, just giving you the opportunity since you're in the cloud as well. Okay, so we are voting on the amendment for a part-time staff member. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Nay. 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 Okay. The nays have it. Council Member Stewart. Uh, oh, I. Uh, Chrissy, I, I had just texted you actually a okay. couple of times. Council, okay. Council Member Hornish then. 
I would like to call the question on the main motion. No. The question has been called. So all those in favor of calling the question, say aye. 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 I don't, Council Member Ross, I don't know how you voted. This is to call the question to pass the budget. Yes. As amended with 150. I'm, I'm confused on what the. It, he's just called the, we're not, we're not voting on anything other than calling the question so we can vote. But there are. The main, the main motion. Okay. No, but, but to call the question, negate that. I know, call but the I want to kill some of the roasts. I got the floor okay. right now, I believe, 120,000 okay. plus 150 would be the call the question. Right, but we're not voting on that until we call the question. We have to no. vote to call the right. question. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Opposed. Nay. Nay. Okay, the ayes have it. We are calling the question. The question is... Um, the main motion to adopt the proposed budget with $120,000 for IT and $150,000 in grant funding. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, by a vote of 4-2, the ayes have it. The budget has been passed. Okay, we are moving on to um, our next public hearing, which is uh, relating to the levying of regular property taxes and the establishment, uh, the amount to be levied in 2020 on the assessed value. Um, Mr. Acting City Manager. Aaron, do you have anything? Okay. So if Aaron has nothing, I'm turning this over to council and this is relative to the 1% um, levy rate increase. Mm -hmm. Council Member Ritchie. Uh, I do not support raising taxes during a mid-biennial budget cycle or review because we have not found any specific emergent need to do it. I think this is more well placed for a uh, the 2021 or 21 22 budget when we review that next year. <clears throat> Aaron, I have a question. Um, because we just passed additional funding um, in the last one, do we need that 1%? <laughs> because we just passed a $150,000 emergent need. 270, so. technically. Well, because there's the 120 as well, yes. But so without further action on the budget, that would go to the fund balance is how that would play out. So the expenditure increase would, in, would increase per the amendments that were passed and mm -hmm. the fund balance would be re reduced is how it would play out if gotcha. there's no action on the revenue. Got it. Okay. Council Member Stewart. Well, again, this would be the 11th year in a row that we would not take the 1%. It would be since, uh, I think, not to misquote, but I want to say it's since 2006 that we have been effectively lowering the, uh, the tax rate uh, on our residents, which is, is fine, except for the fact that we are running uh, operationally in a deficit situation at this point. So I would be supportive of taking the 1%. Uh, if for no other reason we have an extra $270,000 of expenses we just passed, which will further erode uh, our operational budget. Aaron, if I can, even if we take the 1%, we're still lowering the levy rate, are we not? By three cents? That is correct. The okay. 1% is equivalent to a, a penny per thousand of assessed valuation. So instead of a $1.50, it'd be $1.51 as a levy rate. Councilman Ritchie. Hey, Aaron. I'm not an accountant or a financial guy. Uh, do we have money in the bank to do this? I mean, if you go and you pick up McDonald's and you're out of money in your account, they'll hand your card back and say you got another card. My question here is, do we have resources, money in the bank to cover $270,000 worth of additional funding without raising revenue right now? Yes. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Moran. Um, I am not uh, one of those who believes to live happy today so that I don't have money tomorrow. Um, 
and I don't like to raise taxes um, unless I absolutely have to. But we just came through um, a campaign that one thing was very clear, and that is that people are very unhappy with the infrastructure needs. And um, we are uh, looking at a budget where our infrastructure needs are very heavy. And to, to look at that amount of money that we need and to not start taking this 1%, even if it is to bank it toward what we need for infrastructure, I, I, I just don't know how we would be able to do it if we, we don't start taking that 1%. Okay, I don't have any more lights. Oh, Councilmember Hornish. Um, yeah, question for Aaron. Um, money flowing in, money flowing out. And I know it's, it's always, even after my four years here on the council, I still can't quite figure out the whole uh, bar system uh, other than the, the bars that we go drink at. Um, the uh, trying, to, <laughs> trying to figure out on, on a flow rate basis, for 2020, do we have more money budgeted to come in revenue versus the expenses, including the 270 increase? Or does the 270 take us over the budgeted revenue for expenses overall? Well, and, and, assume, and, and, and disregarding capital. I'm, I'm talking about operating, I guess, is what I'm trying to get to. Okay. So, uh as we looked at it, the study session on the 12th, just a reminder, the general fund had less revenues, so general funds, the general operating fund, less revenues than what the budgeted expenditures were. So we just increased expenditures, uh, but we also had fund balance. So there's the savings account and the reserves, strategic reserve in the general fund. So but, just, but where I always get confused, we always transfer money back into the general fund at the end of the year because we have we didn't spend it or, or you know, we have excess funds available. Well, it remains in the general fund, right? So the revenue to the general fund, expenditures in the general fund are above the budgeted revenue amounts and that draws down the reserves for that particular year, but there is still reserves remaining in the general fund. How much fund. will we over before the 270? of expenses over revenue. I think it was around 16 million. I'll go grab that number real quick. I need a motion well, that's, to- that's taking no capital. I need a motion to extend. Uh, the general so moved. Uh, 1115, please. please I think we please, get please. it through by 11 o'clock. <laughs> oh, but 1115. Okay, need a second. Second. Okay, it's been moved second. and seconded. All those in favor of extending to 1115, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Nay. Okay, by a vote of 5-1, we are extending to 11-15. Okay, so back to the discussion. I, I think it was $16 million, but I was trying to back out the large capital at the CapEx, Aaron. That's yes. why I was trying to focus more on the operating. Didn't, yeah, the 16 didn't they leave about $5 million for the general fund? So yeah. I'm, I'm looking at one uh, page one in the packet where it's going through the different uh, summaries by year. And so the 2020 revised budget summary shows the general fund first, it's 20 million, 21 million, 91,494, that's the beginning fund balance, budgeted revenues of 44 million, expenditures budgeted at 48 million, and that would be um, with those two amendments tonight, so that's gonna go up slightly. The ending fund balance previously coming in was 16.9 million in 2020, so that's an estimated fund position, so that's gonna go down by the increased expenditure authorities that was done during the amendment. And that is, that's just the general fund. Of course, that would flow through to all of the funds on that table. So let me ask a, a different way, and I think you were around when we always talked about the crossover point, which was trying to bake all this in. Are, are you saying that on a aggregate basis, I mean, because we have big capital expenditures, and I think that's kind of Council Member Moran's point that you know we've got to have these savings to pay this capex, um, but we're spending more than we're bringing in right now. Is what you're saying? Yes, in the general fund. All right. That's where I always got confused because that that was happening a long time ago, but yet we weren't at the crossover point. 
That's correct. Our historical pattern has been we save money in the general fund and make those transfers into the capital fund. So we're doing a kind of a pay-as-you-go process where we build up the reserves and then transfer those over the capital funds. So that that's part of that conversation about the 10% strategic reserve of the general fund. So as a reminder that the 16.9 million that we were talking about as the ending fund balance in the general fund, there's 4.4 million would be this 10, the 10% 10 strategic reserve. So the amount over 4.4 million would then be, you could transfer that towards a capital project or, or one-time uh, related cost. Now keeping in mind that's really just capital. a one-time position, yeah to our capital expense. Gotcha. So we, we have twelve million above the strategic reserve as ending fund balance as a reserve in the general fund right now. Or did we transfer any of that at the beginning of the year? We did, yeah. Um, to the capital accounts. But we kept it at that number. All right, I got it. Now that's helpful. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart. I think um, one question that Councilmember Hornish asked and I'm not sure if you answered was um, Operations only, so excluding the capital expenditures, what is our revenue versus expenditures from an operations standpoint? Yeah, so I'm trying to recall the <laughs> the conversation we had on the 12th. I, I believe the operating funds only, and when we talk about operations, it's general fund plus street funds. So if we're following along in the discussions. It's 001 fund, general fund. 101 is this, the street fund, which is other operating um, funds as well. So the combination of those two, I believe the number was around a five million. So we talked about that note at the bottom of the ending fund balance being 18 million, but the majority of that was related to the capital funds, and the two that were related to the operating funds were a draw, drawdown of the five million. So that's just the budgeted drawdown within the period. So Still that means that we're spending this. operationally, we're spending five million more than we're bringing in in revenues right now. Budgeted to from yes. from an operate again, not including capital expenditures. Okay, thanks. Okay, I have no more lights on. So I have a, I have a couple questions. Okay, go ahead, Councilmember Ross. Okay, the fir the first question to Aaron is when do we do the next bi biennium budget? Do it? Was that the question? When did we do it? November next year. Yeah, it's going to be this yeah, time what, next what, year. What's the timing of it? November, right? Yeah, That's next year. This year. Which is timed about, and then as far as the 1% approval, that only can happen during this period as well. So we'd have to effectively, if we don't approve it today, it becomes same time next year. I didn't make Correct. Any time in the. Yes, correct. The, the property tax action is once a year that that's considered. Thanks. That, that helped. Okay. So if we're going to do anything with this ordinance, we need a motion. I, I guess I, I, my, I just want a commentary on that. Uh, this, my, my position is I want to bundle all the tax decisions as it relates to our greatest needs, which will likely be infrastructure. And I, I'm not gonna support a 1% increase this time. I'd like to pool all of our uh, police sum assessments and other um, key expenditures and funding at the biennium budget next year in November. So I'm gonna defer that, that in all decisions on what type of tax sources supporting those important objectives will come from. We don't have a motion on the floor for. I've got I've got a motion. Great. Go ahead. I would like to move that council approve the 2020 property tax levy, including the allowable one percent increase. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any more discussion? Okay. Yes. So this would be taking the one percent. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. No, nay. Okay, yeah, motion fails because we have a 3-3 three, three split. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm not gonna read you my council report. However, there is very important information in there. Um, 
So I think we have a second ordinance there oh, for property do. tax. So there was two options. Oh, sorry, one I is the one percent. Skip over that. <laughs> so that that second one, although it's zero percent in the regular levy rate, is is authorizing the bank capacity and the, okay. and the rest of the levy amount. The ten percent. Bank ten, we have. It's allowing the ability to bank that. 1% so for because, the future. Because the motion failed and we're not taking the 1%, we right. need to bank it. To add on to the 10, sorry. Yep. All right. I would entertain a motion. I have a motion. Go. Uh, that we bank the 1%. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, by vote of 6-0, we will bank the 1%. All right, now moving on. Um, again, not reading my council report. There's very important information in there and I do need feedback from council at some point in the very near future. Anything else? Oh. Yes, thank you. Just one thing, Mayor. Yes. I just wanted to recommend canceling the December 2nd meeting Pardon? No. December 2nd. December 2nd meeting, which is a study session, plans study session. Uh, the December 10th meeting mm -hmm. and the December 7th, 17th meeting, which are already tentatively canceled. There's nothing on the agenda for those three meetings. So that just leaves one more meeting this year, December 3rd. December 3rd would be the last meeting of the year, Thank regular you. meeting. So moved. Second. Um. Any discussion? Councilmember Stewart. So I have uh, a, an agenda item we need to um, add and it can possibly go on December 3rd. I don't know how full that agenda is, but uh, we need to um, look at the K4C uh, to see if we want to sign on to the amended letter. It's been updated with some minor updates um, and we can get someone from King County to come speak to it or I can provide an overview uh, and I will share out the, the amended letter, but we are a founding city, uh, partner city for the K4C effort, but we, we need to get that. If we're gonna sign on, we need to do it before the end of the year. Can that be done at the December 3rd meeting? If we have if we have room in the agenda, can we fit that in? I've not seen the agenda, Lita. Okay. Okay, great. Call the question. We can even put that in consent if okay. there's nothing remarkable. It can be always be pulled off consent. Okay. That'll save time too. All right, great. Okay. What, one more thing, Mayor, if yes. be so bold. We need that. Oh, yeah. I mo we moved so it. We need to vote on that. Oh, sorry. It's and right. I think mm -hmm. Councilmember Stewart seconded it, and then we got sidetracked. So yep. let's. Okay. So we're voting on canceling the December second study session. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. It was actually aye. point it was of order. It, right? it was actually it was the the second, the tenth, and the seventeenth. Eleventh. Yeah. Eleven. Second. Eleventh. Tenth and seventeenth. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. Because they all say tentative. They Same vote on here. All six yays. Okay. Yay. All right. So yes. So we're canceling. <laughs> that's the second, tenth, and seventeenth. Yes. That are canceled. Okay. You want us to take a formal vote on that, Alita? We just Since, didn't. Did well, we? but I said the good. second when I read it back. So just. <clears throat> just do it again. Do you have it? Okay. Or. Okay. Okay. Um, so then all we need to do is adjourn. Move to adjourn. Okay, hey, it's been moved and seconded. Oh, did you have one more thing? Just one more thing. It can wait till the third, but I was gonna recommend canceling the, I'm, I'm being really bold here. Yeah, go for the, it. The, the January 6th planned study session, because I'd like to see us get into this new meeting cadence where we have a regular meeting on the first Tuesday, a study session on the second Tuesday, and a regular meeting on the third Tuesday. Yep. So in that spirit, I recommend canceling the January 6th planned st study session. So okay. moved. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay, by a vote of 6-0, we'll be canceling that study session on the 6th. Okay. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, by a vote of 6-0, we are adjourned. <laughs>